Texas, outside of Chicago, as Fox Sports Ohio brings you Cincinnati Reds baseball. Yesterday's rainout gives us a double dip today as the Reds take on the White Sox for the first time in Chicago since 2001. Just to bring you up to date on what we'll be bringing you today. Game one coming up in just a couple of minutes. Game two, we'll have a post-game show following game one. Then about a half hour later, game two, Jason Marquis will go to the mound. And then we'll have a Reds Live post-game show following that. So a full day of baseball here on the south side of Chicago. Hi, hello, and welcome to U.S. Cellular Field, the new Comiskey Park. George Grant along with the crafty left-hander Chris Wells. Chris, um, you know, we talk about coming to Chicago. We usually go to the north side. We're here on the south side this time. We get to see a Chicago White Sox club that has been tough for the Reds over the years. Well, you're right. I mean, especially recently, they've simply dominated every time they've had a chance to play the Reds, which really isn't all that often. And a lot of people thought coming out of spring training, this White Sox team would be one in the Central Division of the American League that not only should contend, but maybe run away with it. That has not been the case so far. They've struggled out of the gate, but still a very tough test for the Reds in two games today. Johnny Cueto gets the ball for the Reds today. The blip in the radar screen from Atlanta, was that just a blip on the radar screen? You know, every time Johnny Cueto pitches a bad game, you're thinking you're only one game closer to him pitching a gem. And here's what he has done in interleague action since 2000. 11 major league ranks just look at that last column on the right second best pitcher in the big leagues in earned run average opponent batting average he's fourth in winnings and winning percentage i mean johnny cueto is one of the elite pitchers in the league uh, and really in all of baseball and you got to figure that he'll be back on top of his game today the reds will need him because remember in the first game joey Votto not available and talk about one of the elite players that is Jose Abreu for the Chicago White Sox. He was a rookie of the year last year, a silver bat winner. This kid's a real deal. Well, when the Chicago White Sox signed him, he's a, a Cuban defector. They thought a lot of scouts said, hey, you know, this guy will knock a hit big league pitching. He's got a slider speed bat. Well, he disproved all those doubters last year with an incredible year. Uh, and then this year he's following up on it. He's a full package, good batting average, with lots of power, leave a putt pitch out over the plate. He gets your brand new baseball. A guy who's left a few out over the plate is Hector Noessi. He'll get the ball for the White Sox in game number one today. Well, he's not really had regular pitching. Noessi's kind of filling in right now. They're hoping that that spot in the rotation eventually goes to the second game pitcher, Carlos Rodon. But uh, until that happens, Noessi, who's been around a little bit, 0-3 record. He's had three starts. Each one of those starts has been separated by about 10 days. So he's really not gotten into the flow. I can tell you, he throws 93, 94 miles an hour. He's got a good, nice little change up. So we'll see what he's got ready for the Reds here this afternoon. Talked a lot about the pitching, but how about the hitting? The Reds hitting has gotten better of late in the month of May, June day. That and more coming next. It's the Reds against the White Sox on Fox Sports Ohio.
Brandon Phillips does as he does before most games. That will be signed autographs for the fans. I'm Jim Day on the field. It's a chilly May day here in Chicago. But the Reds' bats have heated up in the month of May at least. The slash numbers. You look at the numbers overall for this Reds offense in April. As a team hit 224 so far. Early in May, I know, but 268. On base percentages higher. And the slugging percentage has gone up with guys like that guy, Marlon Bird. Heating up as well. And you check out our IGS bringing the energy. He's a Reds player is hitting over 300 in the first week of May. Zach Cozart, 5 for 10. And by the way, he's back in the starting lineup. Georgia Chris will have more on that coming up. Phillips, 455. And the aforementioned Marlon Bird, 444. 8 for 18 in the month. And the Reds hope that obviously continues. Coming up, it's interleague action. Finally, a day later than expected, but nonetheless, it's the Reds and the White Sox. Game one of a doubleheader coming up on Fox Sports Ohio. being brought to you by Cincinnati USA Regional Tourism Network. Stay close to CincinnatiUSA.com. By Chevy. Check out our award-winning lineup only at your Tri-State Chevy dealer. And by Skyline Chili. Feeling good? Hey, it's Skyline time. Let's check our Myers starting lineup for Brian Price in the Cincinnati Reds. Billy Hamilton will lead it off, leading the National League with 14 stolen bases. Marlon Bird has been red hot of late at the average now over 200. Todd Frazier behind him. Jay Bruce in the cleanup spot. Brandon Phillips, Pena behind the plate. Cozart back in the lineup at short. Skip Schumacher will be in the lineup as a designated hitter. And Christopher Negron will play first for Joey Votto, who is serving his one-game suspension. On the mound for the White Sox, here's Hector Noesi. Uh, Noesi is a 28-year-old right-hander, originally signed as a free agent by the New York Yankees. He's been around a couple of different ball clubs. And getting a start today, fourth of the year. And a start right away, 0 and 2 to Billy Hamilton. So the third baseman, the last speed drops back to even with the third base bag after being in tight. Your home plate umpire is John Hirschbeck. The veteran, Pat Holberg's at first, DJ Rayburn at second, and John Tumpain is your third base umpire. Here's the 1 2. Raynott yesterday and hit forward. 
a good decision by the White Sox. It never did let up all night long. Doubleheader today, three o'clock and six o'clock, and a single game tomorrow. That's a swing and a miss. Billy's retired, and there's strikeout number one, out number one for Noesi. Here comes Marlin Bird. The average up to 221, five homers, 14 knocked in. He's got a season high four game hitting streak. And boy, talk about April showers turning to May flowers, and the birds will roost. He has been roosting that four game hitting streak. And over the last 12, he's over 300 to 349 and 444 during this month. It's a long process, Chris. You talk about mechanics as a pitcher, but mechanics as a hitter, too. Well, and it's always a game of adjustment. You know, you're adjusting to the pitchers and how they're pitching you, but you're also adjusting to yourself as you change. And, of course, Marlon Bird came on here and wanted to press everybody that the Reds made a good deal with the Phillies to get him. And he probably was trying a little bit too hard. He was swinging at pitches that were out of the zone. Uh, he was guessing at fastballs uh, that were nowhere near strike zone. And he got himself behind a lot of counts, but he seems to be much more relaxed right now. And that's what happens when a hitter gets on a roll. One ball, one strike. And that's up high, two and one. And his mechanics are not simple. Um, his approach is a little different than most hitters. So by his own admission, it takes him time to get into a groove. He made some changes this offseason, and he knew it would take a little bit of time. He didn't think he would lose most of April. But then again, he's been a slow starter throughout his career in April. He's a career 250 hitter for April. That, that is part of the case right there. The other part of it, he's really kind of remade his swing a little bit. He was uh, a home run hitter last year with a ton of strikeouts. Uh, he's always had a little bit better batting average than he did last year, and he tried to come back and maybe make better contact this year. So... He went from a, a situation where he had a wide stance last year where he was kind of uppercutting the ball to a very narrow stance this year, and that didn't work the first month, so he's kind of meeting both of those in the middle now, and that's been, been working for him. Full count, three balls, two strikes, and that's wide ball four. So Marlin marches down to first base, one out, one on. Let's check our four defensive alignment for the White Sox. Some good arms in the outfield, solid defense. Melky Cabrera is in left, Adam Eaton in right, and Avi Garcia is, is Adam Eaton's in center, and Avi Garcia is over in right. Ramirez outstanding defensively and offensively at short. Johnson, your second baseman, Jose Abreu, solid defensively and a, a big time offensive player, silver bat winner down at first. Gillespie's back at third after Beckham was penciled in yesterday. Gillespie's had some plantar fasciitis uh, in his feet the last couple of days took a shot a couple of days ago and he's back in the lineup at third base today. Short lead for Bird. Frazier steps in 10 homers 19 knocked in. League leader in home runs now tied with Bryce Harper. How about Harper? Five home runs the last two games three in a game then two in a game. Boy has he turned it on. For a 22 year old. He is still yet to face a pitcher in professional baseball younger than him, right? <laughs> That's amazing. What a week he's had, too. You know, on the surface, you would think this would be a pretty good matchup for Todd Frazier because, after all, Noesi's main pitch is a fastball. He doesn't have much of a breaking ball. His main breaking ball is a changeup. The only thing that moves away from right handers is a little cutter that he threw. That was the first pitch cutter about 87, 88 miles an hour. Slow toss over to first. One thing that the White Sox, and it's true in the National League too, that the White Sox are very cognizant of trying to keep Billy Hamilton off the bases and understanding that the Reds try to run, try to keep runners as close as they can. That's bloop towards right. It'll drop for a hit. Bird will take the turn but hold. So a flip of the wrist and a base hit for Todd. So there's two on, one out, and here comes Jay Bruce. Yeah, that's one of those situations from a pitching standpoint that you're ahead of the hitter. You want to give him a breaking ball or a cutter going away, and he does there, but it's just not far enough away. And maybe he was surprised by the plate coverage that Todd Frazier has with that swing of his. We've seen him do that a hundred times, and he's actually gotten some hits out of it. You're looking at one right there. Long arm, strong hands. He'll take a pitch that someone else will dribble to second or pop up. And send it to right or right center for a base hit. Tyler Flowers out to talk to his right hander with Bruce at the plate. A 
lot of American League shifting with runners at first and second. The shifting of the White Sox minimal. They'll shift in a normal double play spot with Ramirez almost behind the bag at second. Jay overall five homers 15 knocked in. Comes in. Ironically 259 against left handers and hitting only 134 against right handers. Reds trying to get up on the White Sox early in the first of two. Of this catching tandem. Flowers behind the plate in game number one and Giovanni Soto Soto the better of the offensive catchers and Flowers the better defensively and knowing that the Reds would try to run. That's why he's in there today. Short lead for Bird as Ramirez tries to keep him close. That's a little low. Two and one. Both swings and misses in this at bat have been on that changeup, and that's his pitch of choice to a fastball hitting left handed hitter. And Bruce has yet to be able to figure that pitch out, and you can see him really swinging big right there. Maybe now's the time to try to make contact, get a little base hit like Frazier did, and shorten up your approach. Setting up down and in, that misses inside, and we'll go full three and two. And you mentioned changeup, Chris. There's probably no pitching coach in all of baseball that believes in the changeup more than Don Cooper. Well, I played minor league baseball with Don, and he's always been a, had a good grasp of changing speeds, adding and subtracting, and he preaches that to all of his guys. 3 2, Bruce sends it foul past Billy Hatcher down the first baseline. Hatch in the first base coach's box for the Reds as usual, and Jim Riggleman in the third base box for the Cincinnati Reds. Here's the Hatch man. Try it again, three and two. Guy who hasn't gone deep in games, no Essie already at 20 pitches in this first inning. He got it. Well, if you're looking at the sequence and think trying to guess along with Hector Noesi, what you're seeing is fastball change up, fastball change up. And the last foul ball that was rocketed down the first baseline foul was a change up and here you see how late he is on that fastball. So the way see right now adept at adding and subtracting and kind of getting the hitters off the speed that way. So two away now after the two strikeouts still with the walk and the base hit two on and here comes Brandon. He's got an average over 300 now. Outstanding in the month of May at 455 and the Reds best hitter with runners in scoring position at 345. He's got one out there now. And also traditionally we've seen it Chris since he joined the Reds from the Indians. He's always played well in interleague play. 303 overall in interleague play 19 home runs. Well, he's swinging especially good right now. Uh, I mean, it's really nice to see Brandon. He came into camp lighter than he is uh, has been in the last few years. I think he's more mobile defensively. I think he's swinging the bat with more authority too, as his wrist gets stronger and stronger. Of course, he had that thumb injury that had surgery on last year, and it just takes a while to come back. I don't think he liked that call from John Hirschbeck. No balls, two strikes. He's a big clutch. Ten of those 14 runs batted in have come with two outs this year. Third out there now for him at second. Hit pretty good, but almost in his tracks is Eaton backing up. He'll snare it, and that's it. So the Reds get two on in the first, but will strand a pair. On to the bottom of one, Cueto takes the mound against Adam Eaton.
club, fourth year managing for the White Sox. So we go to the bottom of one. Let's check his starting lineup. Leading it off will be Adam Eaton. Eaton in the leadoff spot. Melky Cabrera bats in the number two spot. It'll be Jose Abreu, last year's rookie of the year, hitting third. Adam LaRoche behind him. Avisel Garcia will be in right, hitting fifth in the lineup. Gillespie, Ramirez, Flowers, and Johnson. That's your White Sox batting order for game one of this doubleheader. And here's Johnny. Uh, Johnny, based on what he does during the day, and he's been a terrific pitcher during the day, earned an average during the day. Lifetime for Johnny is 2.4. And that's why he is getting the daytime start here this afternoon. Numbers overall this year very good, even with a bad outing his last time out against the Atlanta Braves. Earned an average still of 2.7. I think there are a lot of pitchers around the league that would swap that out. Slap down the left field line, curving foul. It'll be in the seats. The ball's two strikes to Eaton, who's in at an even 200. 26 years of age, Miami of Ohio product, solid player. The White Sox picked him up before last season, had a great first year with Chicago, trying to redo those numbers for this year off to an early struggle slaps this one into the corner long run bird can he get there no it's one hop off the wall and Adam Eaton will have a leadoff double here in the bottom of the first inning boy Eaton just looked like he just slapped at that ball and it kept going and going you know we hear so much about how the ball really carries at the at the US cellular field that no lie I mean that ball is up yes it's away but that wasn't exactly a stay back and drive at the left field kind of swing, and it went one hop up against the wall. A runner in scoring position as Bird bangs into the wall and gets it back in rapidly. And here's Cabrera. White Sox spent big in the offseason, $140 million of new contracts and free agents added to this roster and they've struggled to get going early they're 10 and 15 coming in and whenever you change uh, not only did they add a lot of new people gone as Paul Canerco and gone as Adam Dunn both of them leaders in the clubhouse so they're striving to get it all together but they've got some potential power Cabrera is certainly one of them Elke with a homer and 10 knocked in against Cueto he's had some success five for ten in his career. Been the White Sox best hitter with runners in scoring position this year, over 400. That sneaks in under his arms, but inside for a ball, one and two. Adam LaRoche, a big time defensive first baseman, but now in a position where he's been DHing, he's in the on deck circle. After a brave, that's lined into center over his Hamilton. He's got it. That'll get. The runner from second to third easily. The speed of Eaton gets him there. So they advance a runner, and there's a runner at third with one out. Little, little things. That's what Robin Ventura is preaching before the game. Try to have productive at bats, and that's what Melky Cabrera does. Let's check your four defensive alignment for the Reds. Bird, Hamilton, Bruce in the outfield. Frazier, Cozart, Phillips, Negron at first for Joey Votto, who sits out game one of the doubleheader with his one game suspension and Pena behind the plate. Infield in for the Reds. And here is a brave. Yeah, the Reds have an interesting way of playing the infield in. They bring the three guys, first, second, and shortstop in right at the edge of the grass along here. And then you'll notice over by the third baseman that, that Todd Frazier is essentially going to hold the runner on third. And doing that, you really limit the lead that he can get. And a ball that may not be right at the fielder could still be a play at the plate if you can shorten up that lead a third enough. First down with Johnny Cueto. Ahead, no balls and two strikes. He's in command of this at bat. He's not worried about the man a third at all. He's thinking about getting a strikeout here against one of the better hitters in all of baseball. Rayo with 16 runs batted in and five home runs. If there's been a problem for the White Sox, it's been getting the lead early, and the numbers tell the story. They have only seven first inning runs this year. That's the fewest, not just in the American League, but the fewest in all of Major League Baseball. Runner down at third now with one away. 
Slap to the right side. That'll be out of play. Uh, you can see clearly the two different motives of the pitcher and batter here. Batter just wants to put the bat on the ball and get into the outfield. You think that Jose Abreu, with the power that he has, could just put a half a swing on a ball and get a sacrifice fly out of it. Meanwhile, Johnny Cueto is one of those rare pitchers that when he needs to add a little bit to his fastball, he can reach back and get it. One, two. Foul down the third baseline. Try it again. One ball, two strikes. That's hanging in there pretty good. Fouled off a, a fastball the other way. Goes ahead of the breaking ball a little bit there, but still was able to stay alive. And Chris, we watched it for so many years when Griffey steps into the batter's box, it sounded different. When Abreu steps into the batting cage during BP, the ball sounds different. This kid has immense power and an easy swing at the plate. One ball, two strikes. I'm not so sure how often the Reds or White Sox fans will see the infield being played in in the first inning in an American League game. And he's, of course, the Reds have been in so many low-scoring ball games this year. It's it's really a page out of Tony Larusa's book. Of course, he managed here for quite a while in Chicago for the White Sox, but it, when he was managing the Cardinals, it always seemed that they never wanted to give you anything, any run at any point in the ball game, even in the first inning. And here the Reds are doing the same thing. One, two. Did he go? No, says Pat Holberg down at first base. It's a pretty good at bat right here. This young man's given Johnny Cueto. You see why he's Watch as the bat good as head. he is. That's what the umpire is looking for right there in determining whether he makes an offer at the pitch. Two two. And he hangs in there once again. Ninth pitch of the at bat coming up, yeah, including think, five foul balls. And Cueto's thrown him about everything he's got. He throws essentially six different pitches if you include the little finger pressure on his fastballs. Back to short, but off his foot. And he fouls off another. Whew. That's got to be parking. I mean, that ball went out hard. Ooh. The, oh, that was off the ankle bone. Comes Robin Ventura and Herm Schneider, the trainer for this White Sox club, right off the top of the ankle. I'm not really sure why more hitters don't just automatically wear one of those. Yep. Why they wait until they get one off their ankle and it starts to bark and wakes them up at night, ice in it every day, and then you wear one for a couple of months. going to hang in there. Now Johnny Cueto wants to be real mean about this. Same place. He goes in the sinker down and in again. Sixteen pitches already for Cueto. Nine of them in this at bat alone. On the stretch is Cueto. Down the first baseline, long run Negron. Can he get there? Yes, he does. Good job, Negron. And they snuff out finally Abreu. Well, that's what you do when you put a, a utility infielder to pick up at first base when your regular guy's not available. Negron is the second fastest player on this red squad, and he got under this ball, got over there to the to the fencing at the, by the stands. Look at he split made a play that a lot of first basemen wouldn't even get to. There aren't many that would have gotten there. So important second out the Reds can drop the infield back and they were over shift on LaRoche. Adam at 212, three homers, 10 knocked in. One of the big offseason acquisitions and Robin Ventura's tough job is to try to get him some games at first and he's an outstanding defensive first baseman and at bats at the same time. He is the everyday designated hitter. Ball one. That misses inside two and zero. Oh. That 
That's a strike. It's kind of funny that they would sign LaRoche, bring him in here. He won a gold glove in 2012, and they tell him he's going to be a be the DH when he's clearly a superior defensive player to Jose Abreu. Well, I guess they figure from a balance standpoint, he replaces the left-handed power of Adam Dunn. We well, got them both in the lineup. Yep. That's where you play him on defense. Yep. Roche is playing the bench when the team is in the field. And Adam says it's been an adjustment. Uh, and speaking of Adam Dunn, he's a guy like Adam Dunn. Dunn never liked the DH when he played with the Reds. In the American League, he had to. It's a mental approach that you have to completely change the way you look at every game when you've been an everyday player on the field. And maybe they figure the veteran LaRoche has a better and easier way of doing it than a brave. Three and one. That's ball four. Well, they're working Johnny over a little bit this inning, even though they haven't gotten any runs in. They're making him sweat. And here comes Garcia. Good year for him. 319, a homer, nine knocked in. Been solid. One of the few players in this lineup that has been solid with runners in scoring position hitting over 300. Came over from the Tigers organization, and boy, he is shown. Not just offensively, but defensively, what a fine player he is. Hey, big dude. I mean, he may yeah. not even be fully grown yet. He's only 23, 6'4, 240. Hopped up. Can Negron get to this one? Edge of the railing, and he does. Well, thanks to Christopher Negron, Johnny Cueto dodges a bullet here in the first. We're still scoreless. For the second we go, Pena leads it off. The two ends of the spectrum right here, Chris. The Reds, you know, have struggled in interleague play. And, of course, they're 3-14 and 14 against the White Sox. But the White Sox have always been one of the best. Well, against the Reds, they've been outstanding. They've been good overall, fourth best in the major leagues. And the Reds, for some reason, year in and year out, have a hard time doing that. Pena swinging at the first pitch, slices it foul down the right field line and into the seats. Reds are one and nine at U.S. Cellular Field and three and 14 overall against this White Sox team. First time the Reds have been here since 2001. That's why Pena in a 306, no homers, three knocked in. 
Well, that was one of the things we talked about, George, as we sized up this ball club, the Reds, that is, for 2015. And it was improved in interleague play. Last year, the Reds played 20 interleague games, and they won six. So you are just play, trying to push a rock uphill against the rest of the league when you have to make up that much ground when you're 6-14 and 14 in interleague play. And we're not we're not going way back in history now and talking about the teams you know back in the early 2000s. We're talking about last year's yeah. team and, and a, a group that has been together for a long time uh, have to figure out how to start getting it done when they get into the other league. One ball, two strikes, and again, just like in the National League, the strength of the American League is in the Central. I mean, well, you got the Tigers, the Royals, uh, the Chicago White Sox club teams that are pretty formidable. Well, you know and. and all the teams in the National League Central Division are going to be playing all the teams in the American League Central. So it's not like you're playing different teams. Reds, of course, will have a home and home or home and away series against the Indians like they always do for the Battle of Ohio. Dribble down to second under the diving effort of Johnson. So it's a base hit for Payne. So the Reds get their third base runner of the first two innings, a leadoff hit from Payne Jr. Here comes Zach Kozar. Good to see him back in the lineup. He'd been out of the lineup with a pitch that he took on the left wrist and a ball that he took off the finger on his right hand. And he said the the finger's pretty good. The left wrist still a little barky, but he's back in the lineup. In overall at 304. Had a good month of April, even a better month of May. 500 this first week of May. That's hit hard down to short. Bobble, they'll get one on to first. Won't be in time. The bobble by Ramirez prevents them from turning what looked like a tailor made double play ground ball. These are two of the best shortstops that. Didn't win a gold glove last year. Both Ramirez and Cozart outstanding defensively last year. Neither one won the gold glove. Both finalists in the gold glove tabulation. But Cozart's down at first, and here's Schumacher, the designated hitter in game one. That slap foul. Skip overall 160. Still looking for his first run batted in of this young season. They're growing on deck, hitting in the ninth spot with the designated hitter in effect. Well, he really has not had an opportunity to get into any kind of groove at all. Like a lot of extra guys coming off the bench, Schumacher hasn't had much playing time. He only batted one time in the entire series. The Reds were in Pittsburgh. He did get a couple of starts in. Atlanta. One of the, you know, the eternal debates, and we've heard it again this year about the DH against the American League, National League battle, and without the DH, tougher to get people in the lineup. But I remember Whitey Herzog always said in the National League, my job is to get my bench players 10 or 12 at bats a week. Find a way. Either pinch hitting and then double switch them into a game and give them a start. If you do that, you get to the end of the season, you got maybe 200, 250 at bats. Yeah, but you know, Whitey Herzog was managing back before the salaries are so <laughs> uh, stratospheric, stratospheric as they are now. And you're more reluctant to sit a guy who's making 15 or 20 million dollars because you're paying him. Whether he sits or plays, and I think that's one reason why it's di more difficult to get those extra players in. Managers are more reluctant to sit them because the general manager wants manager wants to know, hey, why is this guy on the pine when we're paying him all this money? You're right. It's not necessarily the managerial decision, but the organizational decision that comes down from upstairs. Strikeout number three for Noesi, and here comes Negron. But the other side of that is. You need those at bats to be a productive player. You and can't have a hundred at bats and expect the bench guy to, to be effective. And the everyday player needs some time off. Yep. Here's DeGron in at 118. That 
breaking ball drops in there for a strike. Hey, one thing you notice early on about Noesi is the fact that his fastball has got a little hop on it. He gets it up in the zone and he threw it by uh, Hamilton a couple of times in that at bat. He threw it by Jay Bruce in his at bat. And he just threw it again by Schumacher. Of course, those were all lefties that he ended up getting on the on the fastball. The stretch new SC with Cozart down at first. Uh, you and I had a chance to talk to Don Cooper before the game, and we, we remarked about the old adage that Ray Miller had work fast, throw strikes, change speeds as a pitching coach. And the bottom line of that was Cooper said, Well, I'll amend that. I believe in throw strikes first. Strike one is important, and new SC so far, seven of nine first pitch strikes. And Reds hitters ought to take note. You think maybe Atlanta took note against Cueto the last time out in Atlanta when they hopped on it seemed like every first pitch. Well, you know, I think it was just an off day for Johnny. I also think the balls were falling in that normally did not fall in earlier in the year. I mean, hit batting average against balls in play with Johnny Cueto really, really low this year. So he's bound to have a few fall in from time to time. But yeah, I think there are certain pitchers in the league you don't want to get behind the count on it, and Cueto should be in on that list. Is the one two. Four of the first five run scoring hits that the Braves had came on first pitch swings. One ball, two strikes to Christopher Negron. Start here for game one of the doubleheader. The second game will come half hour after the first game or at six o'clock. It'll be Jason Marquis against Carlos Rondon, the young left hander for the White Sox, who was one of the top draft picks of just a year ago. Series Michael Lorenzen goes for the Reds against John Danks, the veteran left hander for the White Sox. And the dirt goes our thinks it going and then has a second thought and heads back to first. You know, one thing it looks like the White Sox are aware of is the fact that the Reds have been running wild. And I'm not just talking about Billy Hamilton, I'm talking about really everybody up and down the lineup, including Zach Cozart. Who's got average to just a step above average speed. But Noesi is holding the ball different periods of time. I mean, he's really making sure that he doesn't get lazy here and give up an easy stolen base. Nicks away. That'll get Kozart to second. Ah, base hit can get the Reds on the board. Count evens at two balls and two strikes. The grown still looking for his first pitch. His first hit with a runner in scoring position, 0 for 7 coming in. Before you do all that work as a pitcher to hold the runner on, you're changing the times, you hold the ball, you're looking over your shoulder, you're stepping off, you're doing all those things, and you throw a ball in the dirt and the guy gets a second anyway. Wild pitch. Another full count, the fourth in the first two innings for Noesi. Have runners at first and second back to the top of the order. Billy Hamilton. Second walk issued by Noesi. So two on for the second straight inning for the Reds. And here comes Billy who struck out first time up. Good speed at second in Cozart. Outstanding speed at first in Negron.
characteristic first pitch ball for the West on this afternoon. Third on deck for the Reds. It right back off the pitcher. Ramirez falls and the bases will be loaded. If he was able to get to it cleanly, he may have had a chance for the force at second. No chance to get Hamilton, but it'll go as a base hit for Billy. I'm not sure what was louder the crack of the bat or the ball going off the, wow. the backside of Noesi. He tried to get his glove up and may have got him right on the belt. Right by the hip. Take a look real speed. Right above the hip, Herm Schneider out for the second time in two innings to check him out. Boy, Chris, uh, we've known Herm for a lot of years. He came up in the Yankee organization just like you. He's trimmer than we've ever seen him. He huh? sure is. <laughs> Seven years as a trainer and a fixture here in Chicago. That's a tough side, too, Chris. That's his right side, the push off side. They're going to give him a few pitches to throw. So kidney shot right there. Yeah. Well, you know, each team is allowed to add one player to their roster when you have a scheduled doubleheader like the these two teams have today. So the Reds have 26 on their roster. They brought up Pedro Villarreal, an extra pitcher. Only for game two, I'm understand. I understand. Right. It's a tricky area, Chris. You get, you know, the hip area, and then right up above it, you've got your side muscles, your abductor muscles, and then, as you pointed out, even more importantly, you get the kidney area. Well, he says he's out of there. Yeah. That's all. Uh, taking a chance. He says that's it. He goes, it just hurts too much. He don't. I'm sure he doesn't know a whole lot about anatomy, but he knows that side is hurting right now. Scott Carroll had gotten up and started to loosen. They're going to call him in right away. That's it's a shame for Noesi, and we hope it's nothing serious. But uh, Herm Schneider and the White Sox will not take a chance. He's heading back in. So while the pitching change takes place, we'll take time out for these messages. You're watching Reds Baseball on Fox Sports Ohio. Time for our Skyline Chili call to the bullpen. So 
plenty of time uh, to warm up for the new pitcher Scott Carroll. This is a very rarefied doubleheader and even more rare when you talk about facing an American League team in a doubleheader. June 5th 1999 the Reds took both games at Kansas City. And then speaking of Hector Nuesi, June 22nd of 2011 versus the Yankees, the team split a doubleheader. Nuesi gave up six earned runs in just an inning and two-third in game one there. So doubleheaders against Cincinnati, the guy has not had much luck. And George and Chris, we were scouring through the old schedules. Back in the old days when they used to schedule doubleheaders, the last scheduled doubleheader for Cincinnati September 17th, 1987 at oh, Dodgers oh. Stadium. <laughs> that was a scheduled doubleheader. Who was it, Chris? Was it uh, was it last year or the year before we had that doubleheader in San Francisco where we had the rain out in Cincinnati. We had to go there, and the Reds were home game home for one yeah. <laughs> for one game, and the and Giants were home, were home game for yeah, the other. That was an odd one. You know, going back to that, that doubleheader that the Reds had in New York that uh, Jim Day was talking about uh, Johnny Cueto actually won that ball game. He was a winner in that game. It was 10 to 2, and that was a game in which Noesi gave up six runs. Yes, but the star of the game was Chris Heisey. Yep. Heisey, if you remember, had three home runs that day. Hey JD, is your first trip to uh, the new Comiskey to Cellular Field? What do you think? Um, it's okay, George. The sight lines are a little weird. I hear some complaints about the upper deck. I know they've done some things to try to alleviate that, but man, it's awfully steep up there. If you lose your footing up there, look out. You might tumble a long way. But it is interesting to get, uh, you know, when you get in a cab here, you're used to saying, hey, take me to the stadium. And they take you to Wrigley Field. You got to make sure, all right, going to the south side here. I'm going to U.S. Cellular, please. So it's much different, but uh, very nice to come here. It's like the old uh, Sparky Anderson story in New York when he went out of the team hotel and said, take me to the stadium, thinking he's going to Shea Stadium, and they took him to Yankee Stadium his first time in. you got to be specific. Not often the Reds come to this side of town. Here's Scott Carroll who takes over. Carroll, a 30-year-old, originally Signed by the Reds way back when, Chris. Well, 2007 draft, he was a third round draft pick. 6'4, 215 pounder from Kansas City. And here's Marlin. Bird walked his first time on a 3 2 pitch. Bases loaded for the Reds with two away here in the second. That's strike one. So Carroll came in. He was starting to warm up in the bullpen right after the injury to the Noesi. And then as soon as Noesi left the mound, Carroll came in and warmed up the rest of his warmups on the main field. And it's the, the only time in baseball you see that happen is when a pitcher leaves because of an injury. It's kind of a weird thing to have to warm up in front of the other team's bench. Down to third. Tricky hop and held on to by Gillespie. So the Reds will. Leave three more on. They've left five on through two. We're still scoreless.
At com at bat, the number one app for live baseball. At bat is up to the moment, at any moment, with in-game highlights, live look-ins, replays, reviews, radio broadcasts, stat casts, and a whole lot more. Get MLB.com at bat for your smartphone or your tablet. Cueto back to the mound. Here we go to the bottom of two. Connor Gillespie, Alexei Ramirez, and Tyler Flowers do up. Lengthy first inning for Johnny. Gets ahead with strength one for inning number two. 24 pitches in that first inning for Cueto. Gillespie coming off a pretty good year last year. He was a 282 hitter with seven home runs and over 50 runs batted in. Former number one draft pick for the Giants. Traded over here a couple of years ago in a minor league deal for Jeff Soptic. And a 242 with a homer and seven knocked in in the early going of this year. This guy was a he was a crusher at Wichita State. I remember watching some college baseball back in those days. And very highly thought of prospect. And he sneaks that through on the right side for a base hit. The leadoff hitter on for the second straight inning for. The White Sox, and here comes Alexi Ramirez. The uh, final numbers on Noesi goes an inning and two thirds, 46 pitches, no runs, a couple of hits, three strikeouts, and two walks, one wild pitch. Ramirez in at 202, no homers, nine knocked in against Cueto in his career. He's two for three. Outstanding, solid player. Alexei Ramirez. Another native of Cuba and during spring training, he and Brian Pena, our oldest Chapman. There's a line drive to left. Here comes Bird. He's got it. And the runner retreats to first. One away. Interesting though, Chris, you know, you talk about uh, the nature of Cuban baseball and more Cuban players coming. Alexei Ramirez knows a lot about Mini Minoso. He plays for the White Sox, and Mini was always around here. But there are so few Cuban born players, and I asked Alexei if he had talked about Mini with some of the Reds players, and he said a little bit, but not a lot. But what a great legacy that Mini Minoso left for. Not just Cuban players, but for all of baseball. On the north side, you know, it was always Ernie Banks. Let's play two and the big smile on his face here on the south side. Same story. Many was one of the brightest lights you'd ever come across. We lost him earlier this year. So in the last year, it's been rough for Chicago legacy. That's a broken bat off the foot for a foul ball. You lose, lose Ernie Banks, you lose Minnie Minoso, and also Doug Buffone, who was a tremendous player for the Bears and Worked in our business and radio and TV for so many years. Just a lovable guy. So three great names in Chicago sports passing this year. Didn't Minnie Minoso play in five different decades yep. here for the White Sox? They tried to do it for six, but they wouldn't let him do it. <laughs> I mean, five different decades. Always around the ballpark. Hmm. Always a smile on his face. No balls, two strikes. To flowers. Reds double play depth middle of the infield with one away. I mean the Reds are blessed because you know, we've had so many you know, big red machine members and other people through Reds history that the Castellini group continues to bring back on a regular basis. 1990 team just a small example of that. That's a strike on the corner and that'll take care of flowers. Strikeout number one for Cueto. Two away. I'm not so sure Flowers really saw this ball very well. I mean, he was bailing just slightly, but that little breaking ball, a little over the top slider right there, right at the knees. Boy, with the collapse of that backside, I'm not sure there's a whole lot he would do with that pitch anyway. Johnny has the effect on you, doesn't he? Here's Micah Johnson in at 284, no homers, two knocked in. But that's a foul ball.
Johnson's a guy that is from Reds country. He went to Park Tudor High School in Indianapolis, Indiana. Then he went to University of Indiana. He played college baseball for the Hoosiers for a couple of years. Red Sox homegrown talent here. He drafted in the ninth round of 2012. He took online classes last year so he could end up getting his degree. Slap foul the other way and it's 0 and 2. Way to a hit in the count here. Seven pitches as already the White Sox have fouled off 13 of Cueto's pitches, led by Abreu in that 10 pitch at bat in the first. That's a true misses just wide on the outside corner. Well, you know, the White Sox are a little bit like the Braves, and as much as they can really throw a lot of left handed hitters at you if they want, they've got four lefties in the lineup plus the switch hitting Cabrera. And two. That's a ball strike three. Cueto back to back strikeouts, both of them looking. Micah Johnson retired. We're going to the third for the Reds. Frazier will lead it off. American Ballpark as part of Super Saturday's first 25,000 fans in attendance will receive a Johnny Bench Stars of the Queen City Bobblehead presented by John Morrell. For tickets, call 513 381 Reds. Visit select Kroger locations or Reds.com slash tickets. Here's Frazier single to right first time up. We'll lead it off as we go to the third. Runs three hits for the Reds. They've left five stranded in the first two. No runs, two hits for the White Sox. Carroll working all from the stretch. Delivers to Frazier. That's inside for ball one.
Well, we wondered as the inning ended and Micah Johnson was barking at John Hirschbeck behind the plate and Hirschbeck looked at him and pointed to go back into the dugout. He did, but then Hirschbeck motioned to the bench to be quiet. And as it turned out, and Frazier gets plunked on the shoulder, he'll march down to first. And now after momentarily when first take another look at this, that'll just Change flip him up. on the on the elbow. But uh, the hitting coach for the, the White Sox, Todd Steverson, has been ejected from the game after arguing from the bench. Finally, Robin Ventura came out after Steverson came out and jawed back and forth with Hirschbeck, and now we understand that Steverson has been ejected. So, following the Micah Johnson call third strike, Steverson ejected, and the Reds have the leadoff hitter on here in inning number three. There goes Frazier, and he'll easily steal the bag. Number four for Frazier. Well, now, this is what happens when you don't pay attention to the scouting report because Todd Frazier has done this an awful lot where he just takes a very small lead. He puts the pitcher off guard, looks over his shoulder, sees about two feet of a lead, and doesn't even worry about him. And next thing you know, Frazier's got a running start the second. Boy, and it changes the entire inning, too. I mean, if you're if you're pitching in a situation like that and you're Scott Carroll you're thinking now you were thinking about trying to get a ground ball double play but now you're thinking really about a strikeout 34 of 36 are the Reds in stolen bases thus far this year four for Frazier down to third glove by Gillespie and they'll get the out at first How about that the only time that she's Jay Bruce hits the ball the other way. You got a guy standing there and you only have a guy standing there because the third baseman really can't go into a shift because you have a runner at second base. You got to save that swing with nobody on. Instead of a double it's a ground ball out runner at second one out and here comes Brandon Phillips fly to center to end the first. The other part of that swing is don't you want to get the ball on the right side and move the runner over to third? Productive at bats. That's a strike. Brandon didn't like that, so John Hirschbeck must feel like he's doing a great job behind the plate. Everybody's angry at him. You know you're doing well. Smothered by flowers. Frazier turns around, checks where the outfielders are in left, center, and right. And with one away, measures his lead off second. Johnson trying to keep him as tight as he can. Off the foot. One ball, two strikes. You know, Scott Carroll comes under the category of one man's trash is another man's treasure. The Reds had him in their organization. They drafted him out of out of college, and then he was 22 years old when he signed, and he proceeded to play about well, six or seven years in the Reds minor league organization before they released him in July of 2012. He went to their AAA. White Sox that is and ended up starting a bunch of games for him last year not having all that bad of a year and finds himself in the big leagues of the bullpen this year. Played for Joel Skinner down in Charlotte. Balls, two strikes. Phillips trying to get the Reds a lead and a run in. The 
goes through the signs three times. Here's the 2 2. Hanging in there is Brandon. Circle. Ritz trying to get to Carroll here in a second. If he joined us late, Hector Noesi had to leave the game after being hit by a line drive in the back off the bat of Billy Hamilton. Left with a lower back contusion. Carroll has taken over here out of the bullpen. Missing down and away, and we'll go full three and two. A day where you already have a double header. You know your bullpen can be tested. And the White Sox already dipping into it here in the second and third innings. 3-2. There goes Frazier. Has dribbled in front of the plate. We'll have a play only as Frazier's coming home. Here comes the throw to the plate and he's going to be out. Frazier trying to pick the pocket of Flowers but Good alert play by by Flowers who bounced back to cover the plate. The throw from Abreu in time, and it's a two to three to two double play. As we go to the bottom of inning number three to enjoy a cold one. Look forward to Miller time later in today's game brought to you by Miller Light. Not often you see it, Chris. Two, three, two, double play as Frazier tries to pick the White Sox pocket. I think it was a heads up play by Frazier. It was also a heads up play by Abreu at first base and the catcher. I mean, Abreu's got to come up and throw a strike right there because a bad throw, maybe to the you know the foul territory side on the first base side and he would have been safe. But now that he's got the ball there's no way that Frazier is going to get to the base before. That tag is on him and you don't do that play unless the second out was made at first base. So Frazier had that going for him. And, hey, I, Good idea. I like that kind yep. of aggressive base running. I really do. To the Reds and stranded five through the first two Frazier trying to make something happen. Final out of the inning. Here's Eaton back to the top of the order for the White Sox. He slapped one into the left field corner for a double in the first. 
went to third on a fly ball by Cabrera and was left stranded there. That's a straight. You mentioned that Adam Eaton went to Miami University in Oxford. He also went to Kenton Ridge High School in Springfield, Ohio. Now, if that sounds familiar to you, there are four pretty famous major leaguers that came through that high school. Of course, the Reds had Dave Burba for a while there. They also had Dustin Hermanson, Rick White. And now Adam Eaton. The White Sox have brought in uh, former number one stolen base operative of the St. Louis Cardinals and other teams, Vince Coleman, on this coaching staff. Basically, more than anything else, to work with Adam Eaton about making him the best base stealer he could be. As another ball hit hard down to the first baseman, Negron. Two quick outs, first unassisted, then the three to one put on Carrera retired, two away. And it wasn't. There weren't many base dealers who were better than Vince, Chris. <laughs> well, he, you're right. I got to relive the uh, 17 <laughs> pickoff throws to Vince Coleman <laughs> uh, with him today down there, and uh, he remembered that. Great. Uh, he also remembered you, George, putting it all together when you were hosting the the sports show and putting them all together and hanging me out to dry on it. He stole <laughs> the base, by the way, on the 18th. That's he did. <laughs> Dick Williams. We'll never forget that. <laughs> you know, Vince Coleman is not a full-time coach for the White Sox. He can come and go really as he wishes, and he only comes in on games he wants to see. But the reason he's here is to watch Billy Hamilton. He got phone call after phone call all spring long. People asking him, well, what do you think about Billy Hamilton? Is he as fast as you are? And he said, well, I haven't seen him play yet, but I'm going to see him when he comes to Chicago. Third pop up snared by Negron, 0 for 3 in the third inning. Seven pitch inning for Johnny Cueto. We like that. With highlights, instant analysis, live look ins from around the league. MLB Whip Around, week 1970, Eastern on Fox Sports 1 and streaming live on Fox Sports Go. With Brian Pena, who will lead it off as we head to the top of the fourth, Cozart and Schumacher due to follow. Old adage, get him on, get him over, get him in. The Reds and the White Sox have all gotten them on. Nine on base so far. Nobody has crossed the place yet. Payne is single to lead off the second, up for the second time. Locked 
come up with that with one ball and two strikes. That may be the reason why Scott Carroll is in the major leagues when he was not in the major leagues with the Reds because he's come up with a really nice off speed pitch. Again, looks like he just falls in love with that changeup, and he's got great arm action. Makes sells it like a fastball. And he's been able to work it since he's come into this ball game with a couple out in the second inning. Fastball in the upper 80s, changeup in the mid 70s. There's one away on the ground out. Here's Cozart bounced into a fielder's choice first time up. City and today we're playing again at the top of the heap in the American League Central. They've been trading spots in first place a half a game each day. And the Reds at 14 and 14 coming in. Start a play today, seven and a half back of the Cardinals who won again yesterday. Down to third, past the diving effort by Gillespie. Here's Cozart around first, heading to second. No throw there, and he's got a two base hit. So Zach Cozart picks up his fifth double of the season, and the Reds have another runner in scoring position with one out. Well, after a little bit of a time off with a sore wrist from being hit with a pitch, he has hit the ball extremely hard both times up. Another change up that he, he gets right about knee high and leases it down the left field line. And here comes Schumacher who struck out against Noesi back in the second inning. So Zach's in scoring position. Go! Here goes Cozart. Here comes the no throw. They won't throw as it's dropped by Flowers. Hey, the Reds are taking great pride in what they've done as far as preparation in setting up the stolen base. It's no longer just about Billy Hamilton where you have one elite base dealer and that's it on the team. If you've got a guy that can run average or maybe a step above average like Zach Cozart and he gets a good jump and you feel like the pitcher is slow and deliberate or not likely to throw to a base to pick you off, you take advantage of it. In the dirt with the infield in, blocked by Flowers and Chris. I mean that's it's not a simple process. I mean everyone on this coaching staff. I mean and also I mean you look at the video side of it from the Reds front office down to the coaching staff and there are a lot of people involved in that process. Well this one is really specifically falls on the lap of Mike Stefanski. He's the, he's the guy that assimilates all that information and then puts it in report form. You're right. He does get information from a lot of people around the organization. You've got video that you have to get, and you've got some numbers you may have to delve into minor league numbers and so on on certain players. Like Scott Carroll would be a good example of that. But I mean, somebody's got to sit around and watch that video and come up with a plan. And Stefanski right now is the, is the man that assigned to do that. He's got to be very happy with the way things have worked out. Tagging up at third is Cozart. Good arm out in right field. Here comes a throw to the plate, and he is out. Another runner cut down at the plate by the Reds on a great throw by Avi Garcia. This outfield has good arms, and there's one right at the top of the list. Garcia nails Cozart. The Reds scoreless through the fourth.
Got a look, Chris. Great throw from the right field. And after this play, where one Reds runner, Frazier, cut down at third. The White Sox cut still another runner down at third. What a throw by Garcia. Well, Abasail Garcia really cuts it loose, but on the money. And a nice little short hop pick by Flowers to be able to put the tag on Zach Kozart. The Reds have had five runners left on base. They've had two thrown out the plate, runners in scoring position in every inning. But it's a zip zip ball game. And 0 for 6 with runners in scoring position so far are the Reds on this afternoon. There's a designated hitter, Adam LaRoche, who walked in the first inning. That's a strike on the outside corner, one and one. This guy, we've watched him for a long time, George, and he is hunting for a low fastball just about in every at bat until he gets a couple of strikes on him. A very good low fastball hitter. And I thought that one was a little bit down, and now he's down on a count one ball, and two strikes. Great presence in the clubhouse and a good guy defensively. It's a big swing and a pop up to the left side with the shift on. Who's going to get there? Bird will call everybody off. A little snow cone, but he finally hangs on one away. LaRoche is one of those who the Reds shifted on in his days in the National League and they overshifted that time. So with Pozart pulled behind the second base bag. This is the vulnerable territory right here. A little juggling act by Marlon that time. Good job by Bird to get there, one away. And here's Garcia gets a nice round of applause after his throw from the outfield. the strengths of this White Sox club Chris I mean just like the Reds solid defense in the outfield they've got pretty good outfield arms here they do they really feel that they've got maybe one of the best outfields in baseball from that standpoint each of them are plus throwers out there I've never really seen Garcia play or throw that much but the one opportunity he has had on the day he throws it right on the money at home plate Robin Ventura, solid defensive player at third in his day, and he tried to impress upon this club to do the little things defensively. And while they have struggled at the outset of this year, their outfield has not been a problem. And the other thing is their bullpen. I mean, their bullpen is big time. There's a looping fly ball to left. Here comes Bird. He's got it. Another quick inning. Seven pitches in the third inning for Cueto. Eight pitches in this fourth inning. Still scoreless though.
productive day already at first base, filling in for Joey Votto, suspended for this game. Now, a utility guy, always like to ask the question, George and Chris, does he own a first baseman's glove? Well, the answer to that is yes, but with a little caveat. He's actually using Todd Frazier's first baseman's glove today because he doesn't have his own quite broken in to the point that he likes it. So he likes the way Frazier's glove feels. He travels six gloves, though. One infield glove, one outfield glove, his first baseman glove, and a backup for each. So that case is full when it comes to a utility guy like Christopher Negro. J.D. has really impressed everybody in this organization since coming over from Boston after the the knee injury and everything the way he's come back from the minor league people in the Reds organization all the way to here. He's become a good teammate and so well respected isn't he. Well there's no doubt about that I mean he's a gamer there's no question that he knows that he needs to start hitting more. Uh, it has been a struggle they're trying to get him some at bats to get him out of that slump but uh, anything you ask this guy to do he will do it and you guys have talked many times about his speed it's underrated speed in there. Strike one fly ball to the left Cabrera there and there's one way. Back to the top of the order Billy Hamilton and Chris you mentioned and we both had a chance to talk to Vince Coleman before the game and Vince while he has not seen Billy Hamilton in person he seeks out his games just to get a look at him and I can remember when Willie McGee first came up and, and Vince was in St. Louis. And he spent, they spent a lot of time together. They became best friends. And of course, before that, there was Lou Brock in St. Louis that, that taught it, all of them how to steal a base. But, you know, Vince set the record in the minor leagues. Billy bested that record. And I said, What's the biggest key? And he said, It doesn't have anything to do with legs. It has something to do with what you have inside. You have to be bold. You have to believe in yourself. You have to have confidence. And he said, What I see in Billy Hamilton is that confidence that you don't see very often. Well, he does when he finally gets the first base, but right now there's not a lot of confidence at the plate. And I think the part of the reason why is that Billy's been thwarted when it comes to trying to lay a bunt down, which adds another dimension to his game. He's been in this spot too often, 0 and 1, 0 and 2. That takes the bunting game away from him. Wide a second. Just keeping the foot on the bag is Abreu and. Hamilton has retired one for three so far. May be part of the Major League Baseball All Star action this summer in Cincinnati by visiting T Mobile All Star Fan Fest, the world's largest interactive baseball theme park at the Duke Energy Convention Center, July the 10th through the 14th. Purchase your tickets now at allstargame.com. That's allstargame.com for your July experience, the 10th through the 14th. And they've had the All Star game here. In fact, the very first All Star game was here. Back in 1933, Arch Ward, the former sports writer here in Chicago, was the one who had the idea for the All-Star game. They had the 50th anniversary game here in 1983. Over the years, they've had some special All-Star experiences here. And the Reds and Reds fans will have that same experience come July in Cincinnati. One to Bird, swing and a miss, and it's 0 and 2. Well, he set up that changeup very nicely with the first pitch fastball. Marlon had a good swing at the first pitch, but Carroll is deceptive with that changeup, especially a rare time when you see a righty on righty throw that changeup down and in. That's a pitch that's becoming more and more popular. Fastball misses just wide. One ball, two strikes with two away. Bird on deck. Hit hard and through to the left side. So Marlon Bird has stretched his season long hitting streak to five straight. And the Reds have a two out base hit. You know, it seems like Marlon understands the sequence that. And maybe it's Tyler Flowers back there that's doing this, but I mean, it, rarely does he back up a fastball with another fastball. He didn't do it with no AC. He's not doing it now with Scott Carroll on the mound. It's fastball changeup, fastball off speed pitch, fastball off speed pitch. So after the fastball, he comes right back with another changeup. He missed the fastball away here on an 0 2 count. 
And on one two he throws a change up and Marlins right there to drop the head. Around the stretch. Here's Frazier in. Carroll last couple of years down at AAA with Joel Skinner. Richard Dotson speaking of that era of the White Sox in the 80s. Dot was an outstanding starter here in Chicago. He's now the pitching coach down at AAA. He's turned him from a reliever into a starter and he's back in a relieving role here. Drilled hard to center field, but right there is Eaton Will Holler. And the Reds will strand another runner. They've stranded seven through five. We are still scoreless. Most wins in interleague play since 2008, and Johnny B. Good's on that list, Chris. I'm not sure what it is about Johnny Cueto being able to come over here and pitch in this interleague play. Maybe trying to prove to everybody that he can play in any league. Our T Mobile game changer, not only 12 and 5 overall, an earned run average of 2.48 has been something else. You know what would make that especially. Proud for Johnny Cueto is the Reds' dismal record in interleague play. So if you consider that Cueto is among the the best pitchers win-loss record-wise in interleague play, and you got the Reds one of the worst teams, that's like a Steve Carlton reference. That's ripped into left, dropping it in front of Bird for a base hit for Alexei Ramirez. He hit a run on the button, a line drive to left first time. Up. And this time it drops for a base hit. So the leadoff hitter on for the White Sox for the third time in five innings. And here comes Flowers. Tyler struck out looking first time up. Good size lead for Ramirez down at first. Big swing and a foul ball for strike one. Uh, Flowers is hitting 186. So you're thinking, well, you're down at number eight spot in the order. You got a left hander coming up. Maybe Robin Ventura would be thinking about a sacrifice, but don't even think about it. They've only got two on the season. Not American League Baseball, huh? Well, you know, that was back in the days when they were scoring a whole bunch of runs. People mm -hmm. would say, hey, you know, a sacrifice kills your rally. Well, that's fine if there's going to be, you know, 11 runs scored in the ball game or 12 runs scored, but nowadays you're seeing more and more both leagues low scoring tight ball games and you know a stolen base here or sacrifice there you get a runner in scoring position. Just like a well placed fastball a well placed bunt can fuel a rally. 
no matter I mean, what area you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, but if you just if you're just sitting in the dugout, and you're watching Flowers at bat against Johnny Cueto the first time up. I'm not saying he can't hit Cueto, but it was a mismatch, and now he's down 0 and 2 or 1 and 2. That's a call strike three and. Shaking his head and turning back to the dugout and Flowers, same reaction he had first time. Well, we like it so much, we're going to make it our Cholula flamethrower, our hot sauce special right on the outside corner for Johnny Cueto against Tyler Flowers. Cueto picks up strikeout number three. One away, runner still at first, so the double play still in order, and here's Micah Johnson. He also struck out looking back in the second and that precipitated an argument with the bench and the end result. Todd Stevenson, the hitting coach, ejected from the game by John Hirschbeck, the home plate umpire. Hey, don't forget after game number one of his Doubleheader will have our post game show brought to you by Performance Kings Honda. And following each and every Reds game on Fox Sports Ohio, you'll get caught up on everything thanks to Performance Kings Honda for a complete recap, interviews after every game, these two games included. And right after the post game show, we'll have game number two of this doubleheader. Long day of work back in the brand new studio. Brian Giesen, Slaw, and Jeff Picoro. That misses up and away. Oh, George, long day work. They're back there this morning. They had coffee and donuts. Now they've got soda and uh, pizza. pizza coming in. They'll be ordering Chinese food about the seventh inning of the second game. I can see it all on the desk right now. <laughs> yeah, that's you guys. Maybe in, in Picoro's <laughs> case, it'll be a big plate of pasta. <laughs> Top of the pizza. You know, Cueto was called for a couple of balks. Once in Atlanta, a couple before that, and uh, in the start before that. I'm not so sure though with the brand new umpire down there at first base, Pat Hoberg, that he is going to be looking at some of the same things some of the more veteran umpires are looking at. And there's a blue oh. to short. Wow, did he saw him off. Take that. Two away. And all of the box have been called by veteran um umpires against him. It's almost like they were looking for him. Well, in order to call him, you have to almost have to be looking for him. Boy, trying to bring his hands in just so he can get some of the bat head on that ball unsuccessful. Hurt so much he went to his knees. <laughs> Two away back to Adam Eaton, who doubled in the first and bounced out to first in the third. And the move we're talking about, I mean, most right handers that have really good moves to first base are ball moves. Got him a couple of times. And then Bob Davidson got him in Atlanta. Yep. That's a strike on the inside corner, and Eaton is in an 0 and 2 hole. Eaton really is part of the reason why the Reds are seeing Carlos Radon in the second game. Sounds funny, but it was a game against the Royals on April the 22nd that he grounded back a ground ball to Radon. Ventura, the pitcher, and then Ventura started shouting some profanities at Eaton, and the whole thing started a bench-clearing brawl. As it turned out, Eaton was unaffected, but five of his teammates, including a manager, were ejected, and some have suspensions, and that's why the Reds are not seeing Jeff Samarji in this series. And Chris Sale will pitch next week. They're both unavailable, and of course, Joey Votto sitting out game one of this doubleheader after his one game suspension. 0 2. There goes the runner. It's pop foul. He had the base stolen. April 23rd was the date, Chris, and here it is. Look at the Ventura 
suspended for his actions. Eaton barking back at him. And before it's all over, both benches cleared and look out. It's a bizarre couple of weeks for this White Sox team between that brawl and everything that transpired around it. There goes the runner again. High in the air. Who's going to take charge? Frazier will. And he squeezes it for the final out. Four left on base for the White Sox. Seven left on base for the Reds. We're still scoreless going to the sixth. Saturday's first 25,000 fans will receive a Johnny Bench Stars of the Queen City bobblehead. It's presented by John Morrell. For tickets, 513-381-REDS. Select Kroger locations or reds.com slash tickets. I'm Jim Day. The Reds playing without Joey Votto. Suspended today for this game, the first game of a doubleheader. Now, normally when you're suspended from a game, you are not allowed on the premises at all. In fact, last night he was going to leave the stadium because you physically have to leave, can't even be in the clubhouse. But a little different situation today. The Reds had to call the league office and make sure this was okay because you can't expect a guy to just get out of the cab and go right to home plate and hit. So they were allowing Votto to arrive about 90 minutes before the game. He could not be here for the start of this game. But Joey Votto goes through a very extensive pregame routine. I imagine he is here about now and going through that routine about now. So they had to get a waiver, and it was okay with the National League office. Good job, J.D. It would be good to have uh, Joey Votto back in the lineup for game number two. A jolt from Votto right here would be nice. A jolt from Bruce would be nice in a scoreless ball game. We go to the top of the six. Bruce struck out, grounded out, 0 for 2. Carroll from the stretch, two balls, no strikes. That's a bullet off the glove of Abreu into right. That'll be a base hit. So against the shift, he bounces one off the glove of Abreu, and the Reds have the leadoff hitter on here in the six. <laughs> Hit it very sharply, did Jay Bruce? He could use a few of these. About a week ago, it looked like the swing was right on. He was coming around, Chris, and this week has been a little bit under the weather, not feeling 100%. And these two 10 game road trips taking a toll. And the good news for the Reds after these two 10 game road trips early, the schedule looks smiling on them later on in the season. Short lead for Bruce. Here's Phillips. Fly to right. Then dribble one in front of the plate that turned into a 2 3 2 double play. Down the right field line, curving. It'll be foul and in the seats. Toronto beat Boston 7 to 1. Baltimore beat the Yankees 6 to 2. And games already concluded today. 
Kansas City came back to beat the Tigers six to two. Get one at second on the first won't be in time. By the time Gillespie came down, that gave Phillips all the time he needed to make it to first. So it'll go as a five to four fielder's choice. Nice play by Gillespie at, per, at third base on this one. He had to go to his right, and then he used the bag over there as a little bit of a push off to get a strong throw to second base. But by the time they came all the way around the infield. Brandon Phillips with a little extra pep in his step this year beats it out. So Brandon's on with one away, and here comes Pena, single to right, and bounce to second. No runs, six hits for the Reds, seven left on base already. No runs, three hits for the White Sox. They've left four. I think probably more than anybody else on this Reds ball club, Brian Pena has been here at this ballpark. Of course, he played for Kansas City, played for Detroit. They came in here on a regular basis, and he has done in the course of his career quite well here. In fact, he's got a 339 batting average and 56 at bats here in Chicago on the American League side. And he's one for two today. Put something on here in a game that has really found it very difficult to push any runs home. Well, Scott Carroll hasn't struck out anybody yet. So you, if you have a good contact hitter and you have a contact type pitcher, that's a good combination. A little bigger lead for Phillips down at first. Here's the 1 0. Fifth inning of work, he came in for Hector Noesi, who left after an inning and two thirds, hit by a line drive in the back, a lower back contusion on a line drive from Billy Hamilton. That's a straight one on one. Great to have you with us, George Rand, Chris Welsh, Jim Day. First of two. Second game at six o'clock or 30 minutes after game one is concluded. Jason Marquis set to go for the Reds in game two. And the youngster, Carlos Rondon, for the White Sox. There goes Phillips. That's a bouncer through a base hit. Phillips going around second. He'll head to third and it's first and third. So the Reds put a play on. And it works first and third for the Reds with one out trying to get a run home. It worked even though there was reverse coverage by the White Sox meaning that second baseman was not going over to cover the second base back the shortstop was. But because he was originally in double play depth it opened a little bit of the right side right here and you're going to see the ball dribble right in here and. Brian Pena picks up a hit. The Reds go first and third with one out. Another rally in which the Reds have a runner in scoring position. They've had plenty of opportunities here. See if they can't convert. 0 for 6 so far with runners in scoring position. And here's Cozart. Squeeze. Fouled off at the plate. Try something. The hit and run, then the squeeze. Trying to get a run home. If the squeeze works on a situation where you have first and third and one out, you end up with a run in and a runner in scoring position. So it's not a bad idea at all. The timing probably pretty good. That probably called by Jay Bell down there, the bench coach. Jim Riggleman, the third base coach, leaning into Phillips as he marches off the bag again. Strike one to Cozart. A 
That's got Carroll thinking about it a little bit. <laughs> if he did it once, we could do it twice. Riggleman rolls through the signs once again as Cozart steps out. Ask him to go through it one more time. You know, the squeeze is the kind of play that you can almost tell a team it's coming. And other than a pitch out, if you execute it, there's nothing you can do about it. Jim Riggleman, veteran third base coach, bench coach, and minor league and major league manager, rolling through signs down at third. As usual, Billy Hatcher in the box down at first for the Reds. So now in a hole, 0 and 2 is Cozart. To short, they're going to try for two. Got one at second on to first, not in time, and the throw goes away. It'll go into the stand, so going to second will be Kozar, and the Reds will get a run out of it. So, on a day when the Reds have had all kinds of runners everywhere, it takes a play like this to get a run home, Chris. Well, credit Brian Pena for coming in here quite hard at the second baseman. Micah Johnson. Johnson looked like he may have just had a hard time getting that ball out of his glove and trying to make the turn at second. And there's Brandon with the only run of the game. Reds finally get a run in, lead it one to nothing. Kozart will go to second with two away, and here comes Schumacher. It'll go as a fielder's choice, six to four, an error on the second baseman. Drill towards the alley, it will. Catch grass. Here comes Kozart around third. He'll score. Schumacher trying for second. He'll get in there and skip Schumacher as his first run batted into the season. And the Reds have a 2 0 lead. Solid line shot from Schumacher. Reds lead at 2 0. Stranding six through the first five. The Reds have found a way to get something in. And here comes Negron with another runner in scoring position. First hit with a runner in scoring position for the Reds this afternoon. Negron walked and flied out. 0 for 1. Pitches in his five innings of work. Now the bullpen we mentioned early, Georgia, is one of the real bright spots for the White Sox this year. That'll go through the legs of Flowers down to third, and no one's picked it up yet. But staying right at third will be Schumacher. Power just couldn't find it. And finally, Carroll had to yell at him where it went. What happens usually when it gets by the catcher likes that or bounces off somewhere, catcher has no idea where it is. He's looking all around and everybody's yelling, there, there, there. And finally, they have to point or say backstop in order to get it going in the right direction. Wild pitch charged against Carroll, the runner at third with two away. Ball and two strikes to Negron. Almost another one. Pitching 
coach for the White Sox, Don Cooper, one of the best in the business, Chris. Well, he's reached the, the level of kind of pitching guru. Uh, if you talk to people around Chicago and players that he has coached, and just the general consensus of what people think about him during his tenure here. Swing and a miss in the dirt. They'll get the out at first, but the Reds finally get something rolling. An error and a double play two. The Reds lead it two to nothing for Johnny Cueto as we go to the bottom of six. the Cincinnati Reds. It may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form, and the accounts and descriptions of this game may not be disseminated without the express written consent of the Cincinnati Reds. Two sides of Johnny Cueto, Chris. The Reds lead it two to nothing, and that's usually where he is. He gets about two runs of run support in every game. He's got his two runs, and for him, five innings, three hits, no runs. A walk and three strikeouts. It is Johnny be good as usual. Well, a lot more typical of Johnny today than he was his last time out against the Braves. You know, maybe he cut a deal with Jason Marquis because Plato comes into this ball game. You're right, right around two runs of support on an average this year. It was among the top or the worst five in all of the National League. Whereas Jason Marquis, who's pitching the second game of this twin bill. Gets the most of anybody in the National League over nine runs a game so far, nearly ten. And the Groans had a good game at first base. Three pop-ups that he had to chase down in foul territory, and a couple of nice plays defensively. He took that tricky hop to turn it into an out. Those are the numbers for Johnny in the last 15 starts. It's been amazing, and he keeps you in a ball game time and time again. You talk about the way things started for Cueto. He had a 25-pitch first inning and. His first two innings, Chris, were lengthy in pitches, but since then he's gotten it under control. Well, it's a matter of who can be more patient, the hitter or Johnny Cueto. That's a good point. And you know, we say about there's some pitchers you don't want to get back in the count. They're behind in the count too, and how the Braves are really attacking Johnny Cueto. Well, Cueto, one reason why is because he's got. Really, six different pitches. When you start talking about cutters and sinkers and four seamers and you know uh, changeups and curveballs and sliders, uh, all those pitches, but they're not like I only you throw one or two of these a game. I mean, he he spreads them out and he can throw strikes with all of them. And that fastball can go anywhere from about 91 to 95 or 96 when he really humps up and wants something extra. High in the air to center field. Hamilton back warning track got it. And that's a little gamesmanship from Johnny too. You saw Pena go through the sides. He flashed the fastball away. Johnny shook him off and then again he finally came back. That's what he wanted the fastball away but he used the shake off. 
And Abreu was thinking right with him that time. Well, the other thing he did that Abreu may have been surprised about is that he did not go into his full windup. It was kind of an abbreviated windup where he just took a little step and throw. He didn't give you the big Louis Tion turn. Sometimes that can get you a little bit off your timing. But two away, and here comes the Roach. Walked and flied out. Abreu 0 for 3. Two pop ups to the first baseman, and that fly ball to center field. It was impressive, Chris, around the batting cage today. The Reds, neither the Reds nor the White Sox, had batting practice yesterday because of the rain, but I mean, they knew they're facing Johnny Cueto today and talking to the White Sox and their players around the batting cage. They were looking forward to seeing him in person. Not so much that they wanted to play against him, but there's a great deal of respect, especially from the Dominican and the Cuban players. No doubt about that. That's a fastball on the outside corner. Three balls, one strike to LaRoche. Adam is faced. Cueto a lot, but in his career he's only two for 17 against him. That's a strike. A lot of first pitch strikes for Cueto and only his second three ball count of the afternoon. That's a call strike three. Johnny takes care of business in the six. He's got a two nothing lead to the seventh. We go top of the order to a. NBA playoff action plus highlights of all of today's MLB games. You can see Fox Sports Live tonight on Fox Sports 1 and simulcast on Fox Sports Ohio. And of course, Fox Sports 1 had highlights of that Bulls Cavs game last night. And the guy stepping into the batter's box right now saw it live. Billy Hamilton, as soon as this game was rained out last night, he bolted to the United Center. And despite the lateness of it, was able to get really good tickets. Now, George and Chris, this guy might have a camera operator in his future because he showed me phone video. He shot Derrick Rose's final game or buzzer beating game winner. And I'm going to tell you, he was on it and had the wherewithal after the shot to slowly pan and get a crowd reaction behind him and then pan back and get the reaction of the Bulls on the court. So it was something to see. And Billy Hamilton, uh, well, you got to have connections to get tickets like that and also benefited from a night off in Chicago. Good point, J.D. And the other guy who made his way over there because this game was rained out, Jerry Reinsdorf, who owns both the White Sox and the Bulls. You know where he was sitting last night, Chris. <laughs> I imagine he had pretty good seat. Yep. Here's Billy, 2-0. That's a strike. 
and normally that's a Carlton Fish statue outside the stadium. What do they got? This is the year if they're going to beat the Cavaliers, where they think they've got a chance with Derrick Rose back. That's Pudge with a Bulls jersey on. Two point win for the Bulls last night. Three balls and one strike. Billy on base once today, but that came on a line drive back through the middle off the pitcher Hector Noesi that knocked him from the game and there was a runner on second so he's not had the opportunity to try to steal today. Leading off here in the seventh here's the three one. That's ball four and now we'll see what Billy can do. And the Yeomans worked so far from this reliever Scott Carroll who came in for Noesi with two outs in the Second inning. Sitting on 59 pitches out of the bullpen. Billy, 14 stolen bases out of 15 attempts leading the National League. Here's Marlin. Bird stretched his hitting streak to five straight with a base hit to left in the fifth. One for two and a walk. You know, it's it's worth noting where Jose Abreu is standing at first base. Now he's a little bit closer to the bag now, but he's not putting himself in a position to be able to apply a tag to Billy Hamilton. It looks like that if Hamilton decides to run and runs prematurely, Abreu's got a little bit better throwing lane opened up by being in a step or two. Zach Putnam now up and loosening in the bullpen for the White Sox. The White Sox very cognizant of Hamilton and the Reds philosophy. They've been varying their timing on the mound and also throwing over a lot here in this first game of the doubleheader. A little bigger lead for Hamilton. Not going. Down to third, but foul. Well, the numbers, Chris, we've talked a lot about it over the last two years. Last year, it took him 42 games to reach eight walks. This year, 26 games. That's the good news, but he has not walked. He had not walked in the last 11 games prior to this walk today. So. Well. That's something he's got to improve upon. Well, it just be a little bit more patient. You got to also figure the teams are coming right after. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, their, their main, their, the main line when you go into a scouting meeting about the Reds is, "Do not walk Billy Hamilton." Rule number one. Rule number two is same as rule number one. So that's one of the reasons why, you know, it's going to be more difficult for him to get free passes because pitchers are just going to keep challenging him because you don't want to walk him any more than you wanted to walk Ricky Henderson or. Vince Coleman or anybody else of that caliber. Where Ricky, Vince, Brett Butler were so proficient at though was fouling off a bunch of pitches mm -hmm. to give you extending at bat and eventually work a walk. Hamilton's still working on that. One strike delivery. They'll chase him back again. The other part of this that is oftentimes overlooked is the guy at the plate. You know, when you got Billy Hamilton at first base, uh, the best pitch to throw a runner out on is a fastball. So if you're a fastball, Hitter like Marlon Bird is standing in the box right here. You're thinking, hey, Billy Hamilton on first base ahead of me. I'm getting a whole bunch of number ones coming my way. No balls, one strike. There goes Hamilton. Pitch out. The throw will be in the dirt. Even with the pitch out, he'll beat it. It is he all right? He got leaned on by Micah Johnson with his knee. Is he okay? It looked like he hit the head and the shoulder. See if Billy's okay. Well, he did. He hit his left arm. It looks like he's holding his left biceps right there. And it's not from running into the bag. It's going head first into the leg. And you can see the shoulder right against the shin. The shin bone's a lot stronger than the shoulder bone. And Brian Price is out there having a simultaneous conversation with the second base umpire, DJ Raper, and saying, well, well could that be obstruction? Johnson not getting up immediately and allowing Hamilton to be able to move to third base on this play. He's hurt. Yep. That's not look like he twisted the left arm and shoulder as he tried to wriggle away from Micah Johnson. 
Well, that's that sliding feet head first, you know. Yeah. I know the players feel like it gets them there a little bit quicker. It's been proven that it's not that much quicker. But you can certainly get hurt a lot easier going head first than you can feet first. Remember the bet we used to have with Bip Roberts? You and yeah. I bet him a pizza every time he, he had well, four different a, hand injuries. Yeah, that was about slide into first base for Bip. <laughs> That's a collision. You can see it better at full speed, and you'll get an idea of exactly where he hits his arm and his shoulder here. But when you saw it full speed, you can see how forceful a collision it was. Now, what Johnson is doing there uh, about getting it in front of the base as he takes the throw is not illegal. You can't do that at home plate anymore, but you can do it at the bases. Ball and one strike. You know, and, and back to the batter. I mean, Joey Votto put it about as well as you can. He said he's never had more protection in the lineup from anybody hitting behind him than he's had with Billy Hamilton hitting in front of him with the amount of fastballs that you expect to get with Billy on base. Now, we talk about Vince Coleman being in the building and about stealing bases. And when he talked to Billy Hamilton before the game today, as he was talking to him, Todd Frazier saw them talking. Frazier came over because I mean Frazier was a 30-30 guy last year, stolen base. He said, "What's the one thing you could tell me?" He says, "Steal third base more often. If you want to be a big-time base stealer, you get the opportunity. Take third in the air to center. Eaton backing up. Billy will tag. He's coming. Here comes the throw. It will not be in time. It's a strong throw by Eaton. Yep." Well, they get the runner to third with only one out a productive at bat for Marlon and he, he didn't miss this by much. Chris. Yeah, Marlon jammed himself a little bit. Eaton did about as much as you could in that situation to make it close but with Billy speed he gets the third. In the early days of baseball that was a sacrifice fly now of course you got a score runner to Make it a sacrifice fly, but it was a productive at bat. You see, Billy still swinging that left shoulder and that left arm around. So, a runner at third, that'll force the White Sox to bring the infield in. And here comes Frazier. Frazier, single to right, hit by a pitch and stolen base and line to center. Hunting for RBI here. Two runs, eight hits for the Reds, no runs, three hits against Johnny Cueto of the White Sox. From the stretch. Jay Bruce on deck. Well, if nothing else, Carroll has saved his bullpen with his performance for Dan Cooper. Possibly now at 65 pitches. Well, it could be uh, a guy not used to that, but it also could be a little good old fashioned pitch around right here. Rocketed into the seats down the left field line. Carroll has been pretty good on the day in. When he's coming inside the right handers, he comes in and then off the plate to make sure that that pitch right there is not rocketed fair. Really tough spot to try to keep that ball fair when it's that far inside. Here's the 3 1. That's ball four. Well, here comes Bruce. Jay singled his last time up one for three. First and third of the Reds with Frazier down at first and Hamilton down at third. Well, the White Sox do have two left handers in the bullpen, but neither lefty is up and throwing right now. So that's not an option if you wanted to bring in a lefty to face Jay Bruce. A little surprised at that. Continues to throw. 
Yep, Bobby Thigpen down there. Yep, that's Thiggy. 57 big saves. 57 big ones. Well, he knows a little bit about relief pitching. Set the record of 57 saves with the White Sox and Jeff Torborg here in Chicago. He waves to Robin Ventura that Putnam is ready. So out comes Ventura. That'll be it for Clara Carroll, who saved his bullpen on this day, and Putnam's on his way in while the pitching change takes place. We'll take time out for these messages. You're watching Reds Baseball on Fox Sports Ohio. Being brought to you by Meyer. By your local Ford dealer. Ford Go Further. And by Cincinnati Children's, ranking third in the country on United States News and World Report's Best Children's Hospital. Now, welcome to the city of Chicago where the Reds united Wrigley there on the other side of town visiting the new Comiskey Park, U.S. Cellular Field, where the Reds. Two runs, eight hits, no errors. The White Sox, no runs, three hits, and an error. If he just joined us, Hector Noesi started for Chicago, was drilled by a line drive off the bat of Billy Hamilton, had to leave with a back contusion. Scott Carroll has come in to pitch into the seventh, and now with first and third, here comes Zach Putnam, who takes over with Bruce coming to the plate. Well, Putnam is a split finger pitch specialist. He throws very few fastballs, mostly splitters, and then the next best favorite pitch is a cutter. So if you're a lefty, you're pretty much going to see that splitter almost every pitch. His fastball does when he throws it is around 90 miles an hour. But his go-to pitch is around 85, and we'll see if that is what his pitch of choice is to Jay Bruce. First and third. Hamilton off third, Frazier off first. There goes Frazier again. Ground ball down to second. That'll get a run in. Well, without Frazier going, that might have been a double play as it turns in. Just an out at first. The Reds get a productive at bat, a ground ball to second. And Frazier moving, and they've used the running game for benefit on this day. Hamilton scores, and the Reds lead at three to nothing. Well, the running game can help you in so many different ways. And it just goes to show you right there where you play a little small ball and are able to pick up an extra one there. At least they're working that shoulder. Because he plays hard and plays strong. He's not a big strong guy, but collisions like that, and how often do you talk about it? You, we talk about the great base dealers. There's a shot down to third, smothered by Gillespie, but he bobbles it and it'll have no play. Well, Phillips will be on, and that'll put runners at first and third again with two outs. Ball hit sharply by Phillips. Gillespie goes down and gets it, and he thinks he still has it, except it falls out of his glove, and by the time he retrieves, 
Frazier's on third. Phillips is the first. And the Reds continue the inning. Now let's see if the Reds can cash in again. Here's Pena, two for three, two singles to right. That got him. And the bases will be loaded. Second batter hit by a pitch. Frazier in the third and here Pena in the seventh. Yeah, this is a cutter that just kept cutting and cutting and cutting, and there's nothing that Brian Pena could do to get out of the way of that one. He tried. Tyler Flowers came out just in case Brian Pena, because he looked back at the pitcher, Zach Putnam, and didn't say anything to him. So it could be again, now look, he said, What are you doing? That's that immediate case of the goo you get when you get hit with a ball like that. Automatic reaction. Well, here's Cozart. Cozart bounced into a fielder's choice, double, and then bounced into a fielder's choice on a six to four put out. But when Johnson's throw was in the dirt, got away from the first baseman Abreu, the Reds' first run scored. Base hit here could play two for the Reds. Good base speed for Cincinnati. Just to, to close out the Billy Hamilton saga, Chris, you know, Lou Brock always, he was not a head first slider. He was a feet first slider. Nobody was back in those days. And, and he said part of it, you know, Ricky Henderson was, but he had big, strong hands and forearms. Well, he was well after Lou Brock. Yes. But in the long run, if you're going to steal that much, you're going to punish yourself if you're head first all the time. Tough to change the way you, st you steal, though. You hurt yourself and you're forced to change. Exactly. I mean, Joey went through it, you know, with his knee injury. He has worked so hard to change to his slide to his other leg, which is very difficult to do. You spend your whole life sliding on one leg. The change is not easy. That's a foul ball down the left field line. One ball, two strikes to Cozart. Well, the red small ball today, I, I don't know if they've had a game where they've done it any better. They've had three stolen bases. They have two hit by pitches. A one one wild pitch by the Sox and two errors by the White Sox. And those have all formulated into those three runs the Reds put on the board. Swing and a miss and they strand the bases loaded. 11 left on base for the Reds, but the good news is they pick up another. They lead it three to nothing.
Live presented by Ray St. Clair Roofing. Of course, after today's game, we'll have Reds Live post game. And then before tomorrow's game, we'll have Reds Live pregame. Ron Mellinor and the guys are together in game two probables. Jason Marquis going for the Reds. Carlos Rodon going for the Chicago White Sox. And for the Reds, you can't win two till you win one, Chris. And right now, Johnny Cueto's in the driver's seat, three to nothing. Well, you give him three runs, it's almost like giving another pitcher six runs the way Cueto can finish games out. And you can just kind of see his demeanor change the last couple of innings after the Reds scored those two runs in the top of the sixth. He's the kind of pitcher that begins to smell the end of the line. Uh, Johnny here in the seventh. Facing Garcia, that's a sawed off foul ball down the third baseline. Garcia popped out to the first baseman, Negron, in the first and grounded to short in the fourth. The numbers for Johnny after that first inning of 24 pitches, he's been very manageable with his pitch count. Well, I mean, he's changing everything around. He, he, he's changing speeds. He's pitching in different parts of the strike zone. He's changing the speed of his delivery. I mean, that time it was a very slow big turn. Pitch before that, it was just a step and throw. And he'll throw every different pitch out of every different kind of delivery. I mean, he's kind of a, a power pitching Bronson Arroyo. Something else, huh? And that, that's a great sequence. Those last two pitches for Cueto, both of them change-ups. One was a big, long, deliberate Louis Tion turn. He gets a strike on that. Then he comes back with just a just a step and throw kind of a delivery. And look where they all are. All the way, all of them down there on the right hand bottom of the batter's box. That right on right changeup that uh, has become a very popular pitch. But I'm not sure if anybody does it better than Cueto. Talk about the growth and the development of Johnny Cueto, and here's Connor Gillespie. Gillespie singled and flied out one for two. It's not just the mechanics of his pitching, but the mental approach. He knows where to get outs, he knows how to get outs, and there's two quick outs here in the seventh inning. Well, I doubt that he's ever been more driven than he is this year. For a lot of reasons. You know, I think obviously the final year of his contract, but you know, Chris, you know, we both spent a lot of time talking to him. He's dedicated this year to his mom. And tomorrow, which will be Mother's Day, uh, there, there's no one in all of baseball or in all of the world who has more fond thoughts for their mom back to the Dominican Republic than he has to his mom. There's a shot to left going way back. And Ramirez will deliver the first run for the White Sox. That's gone. Alexei Ramirez gets his first home run of the year. And it's off Johnny Cueto. He hit a bullet. And he hit a line drive to left for an out, a line drive single, and then this one leaves the ballpark. He's had the best at bats against Cueto all day long. That's his 100th career home run and puts the White Sox on the board. Yeah, I don't understand it. Uh, Alexi Rivera's yet with the home run, but I mean, he has hit the ball hard every time up. Uh, I don't know whether he's willing Johnny Cueto to hang that slider right there for him or not, but he certainly hung and he jumped all over. A rocket shot from Alexei Ramirez, and it's a 3 1 ball game. Out in front is Flowers, it's popped up and out of play. You look at the offensive numbers for shortstops, and you know in the National League you don't hear him talked about a lot but he's been a very solid offensive player for this White Sox team now as he hits this stage of his career 33 years of age seems like he's been around a long time huh well, Tyler Flowers is has not had the same opinion of that outer part of the plate that <laughs> John Hirschbeck has had. And for the, try it inside. for the third time today, he strikes out. Twice looking, one swinging, six strikeouts for Cueto. Johnny be good on this day. He leads it three to one.
Branding eight in the sixth inning. They got three hits to take a two to nothing lead. The big hit came on a double from Skip Schumacher that played the second run of the inning after another run scored on an error. Then in the seventh inning, they picked up a run on a ground ball out from Jay Bruce. Meanwhile, Chris, Johnny was good on this day. Well, you're not kidding about that. I'm not sure is he done yet or not. I don't see I don't anybody so. up and ready to go. So I would change that was to is and seven innings of one run baseball. We're kind of used to that with Johnny Cueto on the mound. Sitting on 93 pitches. Cueto with the 3-1 lead and the Reds go back to work here in the eighth inning. Great to have you with us, George Grant, Chris Welch, Jim Day here at the ballpark. Down in the truck as usual. Josh Hall, our producer. Roy Alfers, our director. Matt Sigafoos dialing up those highlights for us. Jimmy Miller with some great work with the graphics back in the studio. Jeff Picoro and Brian Giesenslaw and Ron Melanor ready for Reds Live post game. Great to have you with us. First of two from the White Sox side of Chicago. Here's Putnam continuing here in the eighth inning to face Schumacher. Skip struck out, fly to right, and then doubled in a run in the sixth inning. That's a shot in the right. That's a base hit. So two hits for Schumacher. The run batted in for him in the six was his first of the season, and he gives the Reds a leadoff hit here in the eighth. Yesterday it was hot and humid, and then the rain hit. Today, when we started, it was 65 degrees. The temperature now has dropped some 20 degrees. It's now into the 40s. And you figure game two will be a little brisk. Here's Negron. Walked, flied out, struck out. Your memories of the old Comiskey, Chris. Cold, wet, <laughs> and it's windy, really, and it smelled bad. <laughs> yep, right next to the the stockyards. Other than that, it was great. It was a great part. <laughs> Still, those old ballparks had so much character to them. This place was in pretty bad shape by the time they tore it down. Chases Schumacher back once. Reds already had three stolen bases today and a hit and run that prolonged an inning and an attempted steal, although it was fouled off. A squeeze play. So when you're struggling and you can't find a way, try to manufacture a way, and that's what Brian Price has done. He's rolled out everything today to try to get a run in, and finally, with two in the sixth and one in the seventh, the Reds have. Today we call it small ball, but the guy who invented it was here in Chicago in 1959, the Go-Go Sox. Al Lopez was the manager, and he called it little ball. I remember he at the College World Series one year when I was in school, he gave a, a talk to our ball club and he held up a little ball saying, gentlemen, this little ball controls everything. Here's Putnam to the stretch, runner not going, and that's ball four. Said this little ball can do everything for you. Meaning, and he went through the offense, the defense, what you can do with this little baseball. And if you want to win, as we did in 1959, you take this little ball and do everything you're supposed to do. If you're on defense, you catch that little ball. If you're on offense, you get a bunt down, you move a runner over. For Al Lopez, it was a little ball, not small ball. He's in the Hall of Fame now. I think anybody that's played long enough, and, and he was something else, Al Lopez, but he has had a meeting where their manager has come in with a baseball in his hand and said, Gentlemen, <laughs> this is a baseball. Have you ever seen one of these before? You're playing like you haven't. That sounds like a Frank Howard talk for you in San Diego. Wow, no, that was just a warm up <laughs> for a Frank Howard talk. Hondo. <laughs> Two on for the Reds, nobody out. Here's Billy back to the top of the order. Hamilton struck out, reached on a single, bounced out, and walked and stole a base. 
Dylan Bunt gets it down. Putnam will get the out. Sacrifice for Hamilton, and their runners at second and third with one out. That was really great form by Billy Hamilton right there. And that was the sacrifice bunt. So he squared around really a lot earlier, or he showed the bunt a lot earlier. He never really squared. All he did was pivot his hips a little bit. But in talking to Vince Coleman before the game, he says this is the position you want to be in when you bunt even for a base hit. And oftentimes we see Billy when he's trying to drag that ball down the first baseline, kind of run away from the pitch before the ball is batted. You bunt it while you're in the batter's box, but he does a good job right there and moves those runners up. Get him on, get him over, get him in. Reds have second and third. The infield in for the White Sox, and here's Marlon Bird. Walked, bounced out, singled, and flied out. Five game hitting streak for him now. Fly ball here could give the Reds that three run lead once again. Schumacher. Grown lead off their bases. Single and a walk and put the Reds in good position here. That'll kick away. Here comes the run. Here comes the throw. And it is out. Flowers thought of getting the ball to Putnam, but Putnam wasn't there in time. He dove for the plate and got Schumacher before he could get to the plate. Well, when is the last time you've seen the Reds have three runners thrown out the plate in one game? He never even put a glove on that ball, did he? If he had put a little bit of leather on that ball, it wouldn't have come bounding back to him so quickly. Well, it goes as we'll answer that question is probably 2014. <laughs> it's a wild pitch. And a two unassisted. That's one of the differences. <laughs> we'll say that. <laughs> Going to third is Negron. <laughs> That's probably one of the biggest differences, Chris, in these new ballparks these days. The plate is so close to the back wall and with the padding back there. You don't know. And that's caught by Flowers, so it would look like a promising. Two on one out situation. The Reds go dry in the inning. Still lead it three to one. And is he going to ask him if in fact it hit the dirt or not? We'll let them sort it out. When we come back, we'll check on it for you.
Chicago. Micah Johnson, the number nine hitter, will lead it off. The numbers for Johnny, the only dent in his armor was the home run, first of the year from Alexei Ramirez in the 100th of his career. Johnson today struck out looking, popped to short. Cueto walked Adam LaRoche in the first. The only free pass he issued. And after a 24 pitch first inning, he's been pitch efficient the rest of the afternoon. Locked him up, and it's one and two. I mean, Cueto has pitches. I mean, we, we've got a great view of watching Johnny Cueto pitch from the center field camera. You watch every pitch, and it moves a different way. This will be a tough play. Cueto gets there, and they get the out just barely. No way Phillips could have gotten there. Good job by Johnny. Johnny's got a lot better in, in a number of different areas, one of which is covering his position. Not a difficult play. You just have to make sure that you don't try to rush it when the ball comes down. Take your time and get it to your first baseman. One away back to the top of the order, Adam Eaton. I mean, hiding the ball is something that pitchers are taught to do. You know, it has to do with a little bit of deception and so on. And, and Cueto really never lets the hitter see the baseball until it's coming out of his hand. And he throws all of his pitches from an identical arm slot. So there's no real giveaway there that, you know, he is, is where you hold your glove higher on one pitch than another, or you kick your leg higher on a curveball than a fastball. None of that stuff for Cueto. If you're guessing with him, you're simply guessing. Another first pitch strike, and now it's 0-2. Well, that's nasty, whatever that was. You know, Chris, we, nobody knows what the future holds. You know, and this is Johnny's last year of his contract. I mean, you, you hope he stays in a Reds uniform forever. But as a Reds fan, you just have to appreciate every single outing. He's just so masterful in the way he approaches his job. And it's been... Amazing to watch his growth over the years. Starting when Johnny Almarez signed him to the work that Mario Soto did early in his career, he just has grown so much. And even your tips have helped him. <laughs> he was great. You know, he was we did a number of our Cincinnati Bell and CBTS Tech Talks. Those are great. With him, and I, I kept asking him, I saw Johnny, we're gonna do these in English, right? And he kept telling me yes, and he finally, we finally did it, and he did great, and uh, he knows what he's doing. Uh, but he also, like a lot of great pitchers, has simplified it. And for him, it, it's so much feel. He understands where his body needs to be on a few certain pitches. You know, he didn't learn out of a book. Not down there from coming from San Pedro de Macariz. He learned out on the ball field there. They are, they are dialed in today, I guarantee you. Everybody down in his hometown watching the Reds on Fox Sports Ohio. And Mommy wants to send happy Mother's Day wishes to you. You better believe it, Christina. Christina's doing tremendous, doing well after her heart surgery earlier this year. One ball, two strikes. Grounded out, grounded out. Rayu on deck. Trying to get him to go chase upstairs. 2 2. Talk about developing as a hitter. Chris, we remember those days when Mario Soto spent time with him early in his career back on the backfields. Talking about the mental side of the game. And boy, that is that was where the growth started. Talking about how to prepare mentally, what you have to do to be the best that you could be. Well, we're gonna see a pitcher tomorrow, Michael Lorenzen, young man coming up out of college with a great arm, gifted just like Johnny Cueto was gifted as it with a great arm. But Cueto, you see, has been all over the board as far as speed pitches, and we'll see tomorrow 
where Lorenzen is going to throw a lot of his pitches at the same speed. Cueto, another outstanding inning. Seven strikeouts for Cueto. He leads it three to one going to the ninth. Time brought to you by Miller Light, looking for his first run batted into the season. Skip Schumacher delivers this two base hit, plates the Reds' second run, gave the Reds a two nothing lead. They add it on to make it three nothing. It's now three one. So for Skip Schumacher, big swing, big hit. Miller time brought to you by Miller Light. Good insertion in the lineup as the DH for this game, Chris. Not bad at all for Schumacher. And again, a reminder that Joey Votto will be eligible for game two of this doubleheader after serving his one game suspension here in game one. Chris Frazier, Todd single to right in the first, hit by a pitch in the third. Lined out to center in the fifth and walked in the seventh. And the big guy is up loosening in the bullpen, a roll is Chapman. As Dan Jennings comes in to take over the left hander. Three left handers in this bullpen normally. Zach Duke, Jennings, and Rodon. But Carlos will pitch tomorrow. So he in essence, rather in the second game of this doubleheader, so he in essence is out of that bullpen. Here's Jennings, his 12th game of the season. If you Pick one strong suit of this White Sox club through the first six weeks of the season. It is this bullpen. Well, no doubt about it. And Jennings is part of it. I, I thought this was kind of a funny trade. I thought when I when I saw it, I've always liked Dan Jennings, a hard throwing left-hander from Nebraska. But he has some control problems from time to time. He's walked eight and thirteen innings. It's a pretty good bit of hitting right there. Side out swing gets a base hit for Frazier. So Frazier is on base for the fourth time in five plate appearances, two singles, a walk, and a hit batsman. We've seen Jennings over the last couple of years with the Miami Marlins. That's going down and getting a slider right there. By the time Jennings gets that glove up there, that ball's over the second base bag. Got traded for Andre Rienzo. Also a pitcher who's down in the minor leagues for the Marlins right now. So another leadoff batter on for the Reds. Six of the nine innings the Reds have had the leadoff batter on through the first five. Couldn't push across a run. They got two in the sixth and one in the seventh. Here's Bruce struck out, bounced out, reached on an infield hit, and then bounced into a Ground ball out that produced the Reds' third run in the seventh. After Hamilton had walked, stole the base, and went to third. That's a strike, strike one.
Cardi on that one at 93 miles an hour. He's not going anywhere, Chris. This may be a complete game day, huh? If Chapman's up. You figure he's coming in, though. Well, that's normally the case that they wanted to limit the number of innings warmed up for Roller Chapman. You get him high, you get him in. And he's throwing like he's coming in. He's not soft tossing out there. Second, the throw will not be in time. Heads up play by Frazier. It's a wild pitch, the third wild pitch of the ball game for the White Sox and another runner in scoring position. Yeah, the White Sox really have to feel like they're very fortunate that they're still really still in this ball game. I mean, Reds have had three thrown out the plate. It's a three to one game. That would make it six to one. And none of the ones at the plate were, you know, all of them were very close. I mean, bang, bang. And with that, they've left 12 on base. One and two. And we've talked a lot in these first two months about the Reds only being caught stolen twice. But. The running game isn't just stealing bases, it's being ready to advance. And a good example of that today. That's a perfect first to third, sure. you know, is important. And taking an extra base when you can, getting a bigger lead so that you can get that extra base. It doesn't come just by running, it comes by preparing to run. Third will be Frazier. They'll get the out at first. It'll go as a strikeout, two three. Frazier advances to third, so now with two outs, there's an insurance run out at third. Boy, Tyler Flowers, who is supposedly a superior defensive catcher than their other catcher, Giovanni Soto, has had a hard time today. He's had balls get by him through the wickets. Gone as wild pitches that should have been blocked. So with only one out, the White Sox will have to bring the infield in once again with Frazier at third. Grant has been first pitch swinging. Let's see if he does it again. You know, nothing like having Ethan Cooperson up here as our stats guy because he's so wired tight to the people at Stats Inc. that he looked it up, they looked it up, and found out that that 2 3 2 double play that Brandon Phillips hit in earlier in the game has not been duplicated back to 2000. Wow. In the dirt, Flowers. That's a good block there. One. That's a good block. He gets over there, gets his whole body over. Nice job by Flowers there. Can't beat up on him without giving him some kudos when he deserves it. Now the first. He's too big to get him angry at him, George. First word from the official scorer's booth was a wild pitch. Now they're saying pass ball on that advance to third, not a wild pitch. So it's a pass ball and the strikeout. Fouled off, and it's two and one. Brandon today fly to center that 2 3 2 double play bounced into a fielder's choice and reached on an error. Four time goal winner gold glove winner digs in from the stretches Jennings. 
That's hit through and a base hit and insurance run for the Reds. So good base running by the Reds and a base hit by Brandon gives the Reds an insurance run and they lead it four to one. Where Brandon has looked really good at the plate. I mean he gets his foot down. He's right on time with his 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 foot getting down and his hands staying back. Just a good solid swing. And the basis Frazier has been active today and it's paid off. There's Pena single to right bounce to second single to right and hit by a pitch. Hey, take a look at the Reds dugout. I mean, we can do that, George. Maybe we get a shot of it. I mean, we got a whole bunch of guys standing up from that angle. Hard to tell, but near, I mean, there's only two guys sitting down the whole dugout. Then you go over and look at the White Sox dugout, and you can see where the energy on this ball field is right now, and it's all with the Reds. Nice to see that. You know, Chris, we talked about it early, and even in spring training, we looked at the schedule. And you, know, you always, obviously, want to get off to a good start. And I mean, I thought from the beginning, if the Reds could get through this first five-week stretch and be at 500, I think they would have accomplished something. You know, with the injuries they had going in and uh, Bailey thing, being out. I remember you saying that, George. I, I think one thing you didn't plan on was the Cardinals going 22-7, no. but they didn't get buried. You're right. I think with the schedule they had, those 22 straight against the Central, and I, you know, the Cardinals have a good ball club, no doubt about it. Look at it this way: I mean, this is the difference in the divisions. The White Sox are five games under 500, and they're six and a half games back. The Reds are at even at 500, and they're seven and a half games back. It just ain't fair. I would expect the Cardinals to come back to the pack a little bit too. I mean, they're playing. Miraculously well. We hope Carpenter's okay. He didn't make the trip to Pittsburgh this weekend, but we hope he's okay. Every day it's been a different player that's come up big. Three balls, one strike. The Pena. Well, toss over there one more time. Don't forget when this one is concluded. Labyrinth's live post game. The Jeff Coral, Brian Giesen Slaw, and then. We'll have game two for you about 30 minutes after this one concludes. A strike says John Hirschbeck. Back comes Pena. Three two with one away. That's ball four. Another runner in scoring position, two on, and Dan Cooper will come out and talk to his left hander. There's no one up in the bullpen throwing right now for the White Sox. I think I get the feeling they're saving their bullpen as much as they can, knowing that they're that we're not knowing exactly how deep into the game that the second game starter, Carlos Radon, will, will be able to take them. Roll is now taking a seat until this inning is over, and we find out whether Johnny's going back out there or not. Here comes Cozart. Zach bounced into a fielder's choice, doubled, and bounced into a 6 4 fielder's choice that allowed the Reds' first run to score on an error by the second baseman. 
Johnson in his throw to first. And that last time up, he struck out. When he's put it in play, he's hit it hard. Today, Baltimore beat the Yankees 6 to 2. Toronto over the Red Sox 7 to 1. Kansas City beat Detroit 6 2 in the ninth. Atlanta and Washington are tied at 6 in Washington. Minnesota beat Cleveland seven to four. How about Corey Hunter with a four for four performance last night? In the fourth, Tampa Bay leads Texas three to nothing. Fifth pitch of the inning for Jennings. That's missing inside. And we'll go full three and two. There go the runners. That's inside ball four. Well, we mentioned about Jennings, and uh, the problem that he has had has been throwing the ball over the plate. He came into this ball game with eight walks in 13 innings. He walked two batters his last time out. That was a, a game he pitched a couple of days ago against Detroit, where he gave up two runs in that game. And he's pitched himself in a jam to a point where the Reds are on the verge of blowing it wide open. Now Schumacher had. A big hit to make it 2 nothing with a double in the six for his first run batted into the season. A base hit here could give the Reds a two run more pad. They lead it four to one. Chris, we see Jason Marquis in game number two. Been solid for the Reds. Marquis for a change is probably saying, hey, save some runs for me. And why 
not? This is for ball one and one. You know, and looking at Jan, Dan Jennings' pitch, I mean, there's some deception with that very quick, herky jerky delivery, but along with that comes inconsistency in your release form. Bases loaded one out. That's boot to left. That's going to get one run in. Stopping in third is Pena, and the Reds lead it five to one. Cabrera got in rapidly, so no chance for the runner from second to score. Uh, the White Sox fans are not seeing their, they're used to seeing their bullpen melt down the way it has here. The last few innings, although they were pressed into a long time service by the injury to Noasi early on. Station to station, Reds get one there. Second run scoring hit for Schumacher and third hit of the ball game. Three for five. And a couple of runs batted in. Here's Negron. Hard to believe, but the note that I just received from Ethan Cooper said this is the 32nd Reds plate appearance today with men on base. Even though they're up five to one, they were, they were six for 24. That's an awful lot of opportunities. And 12 left on base already to this point in the ball game. 12 hits and 12 left on. The big number is the four run lead though, five to one. And the old Dusty Baker line. Get another so you pass slam range. Negron walked, flied out, struck out, and walked. Payne is at third, Cozart at second, and Schumacher down at first. Halfway for the White Sox, looking for a ground ball to get out of the inning. Part of the equation for the third time this season, the Reds' eighth or ninth inning rally has taken a save situation and turned it into a non save situation for Roldis Chapman. He might be the only one that cares about that. Yeah. And that's a walk, the third in the inning that will force in another run. And it's now 6-1 Cincinnati. The third walk of the afternoon for Chris Negron. He's filling in quite nicely for Joey Votto. Take it. <laughs> and now they're finally going to get somebody up to loosen in the bullpen for the White Sox. Big right hander Jake Patrika up starting to loosen. You wonder, Chris, if that affects Johnny Cueto's status now, too. He's been sitting here for almost 25 minutes. Yeah, he's actually been standing. I've been watching him in the dugout. He's got a jacket on and his arm wrapped up in a in a towel. To keep it warm, I, I I got a feel that he's already been notified he's out. Ball one to the leadoff hitter Billy Hamilton. Hamilton today struck out, singled off the back of the starting pitcher Hector Nuesi and knocked him from the ball game. He bounced to second, walked, stole a base, scored in the seventh, and sacrificed in the eighth. Is still loaded for the Reds with only one out. Well, I'll tell you what, that, that, the strike zone for Dan Jennings right now is about the size of a soup bowl. And Robin 
Ventura is not even going to. Oh, they're going to go out and find out there's something wrong with him. He just was leaning over that with that last pitch. I mean, you look at and Herm Snyder's out for the third time tonight to check on somebody. 20 balls and 17 strikes in the 37 pitches delivered by Jennings. Watch him right after this pitch is over. He doesn't look right, does he? He may have been battling something before he came in here. Either that or just upset. And appears he's okay. Can you throw one more pitch? We don't want to bring a guy in with a three and zero count and the base is loaded. You've been through that a few times. I, I have not <laughs> seen that yet. <laughs> We've seen a lot, George. I'm not sure if that's one of them. And John Hirschbeck is wondering why are you barking at me. He's getting some words from that White Sox dugout. Already today, the hitting coach for the White Sox has been ejected from the ball game. Todd Stevenson. It came early after a call third strike on back to back batters. That's a strike. Three and one. Are we in South Chicago or are we in the Bronx? Bronx cheer. Center field in the air, eaten under it. The runner tagging in third. Ozart will score easily going from second to third. It will be Schumacher. So a fly ball run batted in for Hamilton. His fifth run batted into the season, and the Reds now lead it seven to one. And the ninth batter of the inning coming to the plate. Now he's going to make the pitching change anyways, but. I'm sure they're not talking about the pitching change right here. So Jennings is gone. With Bird coming to the plate, Patricia will come in and while the pitching, and you can see Jennings not happy at all with home plate umpire John Hirschbeck. While the pitching change takes place, we'll take time out for these messages. You're watching Reds baseball on Fox Sports Ohio. The base is loaded and two outs. And rather first and third now with two outs after the fly ball run batted in. Marlon Berg getting his sixth plate appearance of the day. A rocket shot to left. Forget it. That's gone. A three run home run for Marlon Bird. He had stretched his hitting streak to five straight with a single back in the fifth inning. And that home run is sixth of the year. 
17 runs batted in now. And what a two week stretch he's had. Over 400 for the month of May. I guess his rhythm is back, Chris. Well, you got to figure with the way the control has been in this inning, he's looking for a first pitch strike, and he gets exactly that. I mean, right in the old wheelhouse. Down and in. How about dropping some head on that? Our steel power tool performer rocket shot of the day. Five straight games with multiple hits for the first time in five years for Marlin. He said it's been feeling good of late, and boy, the swing has been outstanding for the last two weeks. 10 1 Cincinnati. After the month of April, he had 168. This month of May, he has been outstanding. Ground ball to second. And that'll take care of it, but the Reds send. 10 to the plate in the ninth inning. They score enough to lead it 10 to 1 with seven in the ninth. And here comes Johnny. Sports Ohio has been brought to you by your local Toyota dealers, proud sponsor of the Cincinnati Reds. And a proud guy on the mound is Johnny Cueto. Boy, he has been good on this day, Chris. Well, we were all wrong about Johnny Cueto being out after eight innings. He is back out there again to try to go for the CG. And so far, pretty doggone good for Johnny. Eight innings of one run, seven strikeout, one walk baseball. And Brian Price had a pretty good idea when you're going to send Johnny Cueto out in the first game to win that game, or at least you're going to get a really good pitching performance. And they're in command right now. Johnny just needs three away to get a, a complete game. Now the numbers 10 runs, 13 hits for the Reds. A run, four hits, two errors for the White Sox here in the ninth. The extra runs put a smiling scoreboard in even in a better spot because here comes Abreu, LaRoche, and Garcia, the heavy part of the lineup for the White Sox. Jose today, a great 10 pitch at bat in the first inning, and he finally popped out down the first baseline in foul territory. A nice play by Negron, and I mean, early in the game, but a key at bat for both Cueto. And Abreu as he kept him off the bases and snuffed out what could have been a rally after a leadoff double by Adam Eaton. And yeah, really the score of this ball game at 10 to 1 is very deceiving because it was a very close ball game until a seventh spot in the ninth. So Plato was pitching with a very small margin of error. If he gets a complete game, it would be his first of the season. He had four last year. Just a masterful performance today, and uh, 
A young man has become a masterful technician at his craft. Number 47, two balls and two strikes here in the ninth against Jose Abreu. That's a bomb out the left. Forget it, that's long gone. Cueto winning the war, but Abreu wins this battle with a big time shot. Uh, Johnny smiled right after that ball left the bat and realized, whoops, he got one right in the hot zone. This is the equivalent of a grudge point. Right, sure sounds different when he hits it, doesn't it? A muscle job from Abreu for him. Home run number six on the year, run batted in number 17. It sounds better when he hits it, but Dill still didn't sound nearly as good as if it had some runners on base. Yeah. <laughs> and you can hit him as far as you want in a 10 to 1 game with nobody on. 10 1's the key number. Eight more of those, and you got a tie game. LaRoche walked, flied out, and struck out. Breaking ball drops in there for a strike, one and two. Afternoon for the White Sox. Eaton has a hit. The homer by Abreu. That's up high for a ball. A home run by Ramirez. Alexi's first homer of the year, 100th of his career. Gillespie had a single. And Ramirez had another single. That's it. That's all Cueto's been touched for. Missing on the outside corner, and that's ball four. So both walks have gone to the Roche. And here comes Brian Price. Well, he's got J.J. Hoover warming up in the bullpen, and, and he may just be going out to Johnny Cueto and ask him, well, how important really is this complete game? Because I'm going to let you go for it, but you got to start getting some guys out here because we don't want to extend you too much now and have you lose a little bit. Not the next start or start after that, but somewhere down the road. I mean, you need to keep that young man strong all the way to the very end of the season and hopefully into the postseason. And their goal is 100 to 100, 110 to 115 pitches. Once you, you don't want to get over 120. And I'm sure he mentioned to Johnny, there's a fly ball to right. Here comes Bruce. Does he get there? No, it's past him into the corner. Around in second, going to third will be LaRoche. He'll stop at third, and it's second and third. So a double for Garcia. Well, the White Sox are coming alive in the ninth. A homer, a walk, and a double. Ball really had a lot of tail on it coming off the bat of a right-hander there. Bruce just unable to get to it. I like the effort though. Came a long way. He I mean, was shaded a, towards right center. In a 10 to 2 ball game, you leave your feet to dive like that rather than, you know, surrounding it, playing it for a single. I like that attitude. Still nobody out. Here's Gillespie who had a single earlier in the day. Tyner singled the lead off the second. Cueto came back to strike out Flowers and Johnson to end that rally. Infield back for the Reds. They'll concede the run to get a ground ball out.
A little bit like a cross up right there. Now there's a little visual communication going on between Cueto and Brian Pena. Pena was standing straight up in the air when he took that pitch. He would figure, Chris, if he did not get this batter, that might be it. You don't want to push him 130 pitches or more, right? Yeah. I don't think that's going to happen. High ball, Bruce over. Tagging it third and scoring. The third run of the afternoon for the White Sox will be Adam LaRoche, the sacrifice fly from Gillespie, and that'll be it. So Cueto wanted to get the complete game, will not get it, as Brian Price will come out and bring Hoover in. But for Johnny, 123 pitches. Trying for the complete game, didn't get it. He was masterful, upset at himself because he had a brilliant one run effort coming into this ninth inning. He'll get a round of applause from the Reds faithful behind that Reds dugout. He was something on this day. When we return, we'll recap this afternoon. You're watching Reds baseball on Fox Sports Ohio. And if you're Johnny Cueto, I mean, he's had 10 of them in his career. This would have been the first of the year for him. And But when you get up 123 pitches, that's the second or the third most he's had in his career. He had 125 earlier this year against the Brewers. But by no means is that a lot of pitches or on the verge of abuse or anything else. So I don't want anybody worrying about Johnny Cueto and the number of pitches he throws. He's a strong young man, and he's in line to pick up a W on the first First of a twin build, nothing wrong with that. Here's Ramirez who lined out, singled in, homered, run around third with one out. It's fouled off to the right side. JJ Hoover into the game for the Reds. Again, if you're just joining us, this game one of a doubleheader. Second game will come approximately 30 minutes after the first one concludes. Still to come. Brian Giesenslaw, Jeff Pecoro standing by with our Reds live post game. By now they've probably had about four pizzas back home. And then we'll be back with game number two, Jason Marquis going up against Carlos Rodon. Start charging the quick flip, and they got it. Nice play by Cozart against the speedy Ramirez. JB Shook come in to pinch hit here in the eighth spot in the lineup. I'll tell you what, it didn't take Christopher Negron very long to figure out that 
what we used to call a Keith Hernandez <laughs> pull of first base. I mean, getting this. Maybe his toe is in contact with the bag, but I always think you come off the bag like that and you give the umpire the feel that it's an out. And you see some veteran first baseman doing it all the time. Hernandez was the first I remember doing it. Well, he may not have been. Here's JB. He was picked up last year at the end of the season from the Indians on waivers. So far this year, five for 20, no homers, three knocked in. You know, the injustice of this in the last inning is that here Cueto exactly. is on the verge of getting a complete game. And instead of not only getting a complete game, it doesn't even go down this performance by Cueto as what they would call now a quality start. Quality start is six innings and giving up three runs or less. But if you go eight and have a couple gassed in, it's not a quality start. I'm not so sure many people pay attention to that stat anyway. Slap down to short, goes hard, and that'll do it. So Johnny was brilliant for eight in the ninth. He gets touched for three runs, but still the Reds come home with a W for Cueto. He'll pick up the victory to stretch his record to 500 at three and three. Cueto outstanding on this day in game one of the twin bill and Chris. I think the other side of it was the way the Reds put small ball into effect and did the little things to score the runs early. Well, they did. You know, they had 13 hits and they were all singles or, or 10 of those were singles, three stolen bases, uh, eight bases on balls. They had a sacrifice fly, a sacrifice. I mean, they did it a lot of different ways, the Reds did today, but they did it with energy. I really like the way they came out here today, knowing it's going to be a long day of baseball. They came out here and they decided we're not going to lose with Johnny Cueto on the mound in the first game, and win they did. And uh, that's the way you begin a two game sweep. You can't sweep two till you win one, and the Reds have won the first of two, 10 to four. Coming up next, Reds Live, presented by Performance Kings Honda. Coming up next.